This is the Iced Coffee Hour. Welcome back. My name is Doug. And so far, I think it has made $65,000 ad revenue. Mm, that's the no. first one in a while. It's been lower. That was, yes. Everyone, it's funny. Everyone says higher. <laughs> higher. Keep <Two> going. <laughs> no, no, no. $166,230. Wow. Why don't I have a podcast? <laughs> you got to do it. It's a lot of work, you know. It's I'm not, good. though. It's so much fun. See, this is relaxing to me. We just filmed a, a main channel video before, and the entire time I was panicking uh, <laughs> because not only do I go in nervous like to, to meet you because I've watched you since 2014 <laughs> with those Ferrari videos. So I was, like, nervous going into it, but I'm more nervous about, like, something doesn't work. Yeah. The audio is going to mess up. The camera is going to mess up. So You feel like this is more casual. Yeah. Well, because if it messes up, it's on Jack. <laughs> True. Very true. <laughs> so. It's stressful for me. Your main channel stuff, I was just, ah, it's fine. It'll be okay. <laughs> so this, it, then, it, then I get angry at Jack. I'm like, ah, well, it's Jack's fault. So I could just relax. That is interesting. Man, I should have a podcast. The problem is I got yeah. a lot of stuff going on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I do think sometimes that I should have done a podcast instead of Cars and Bids would have made life a lot easier. But then you well, got to yeah, get yeah. guests. Yeah. And you got to talk true. about that, stuff. That is a challenging thing. Right. The like getting guests part. people. Yeah. Yeah, in the beginning, it was very interesting uh, and very easy because everyone was new. And it's so oh, yeah. simple to call up, hey, Andre, you want to come, come on the on. podcast? Right. Be over in 15 minutes. Right. Jeremy, what do you have to do today? Come on over. So once you get through the so first 30 simple. of those people. Yeah, I would say the first, I would, maybe the first like 10 to 15 were, I thought, simple. But then after that, you have to really think strategically about like, is this a guest yeah. that once you build an audience, do they do they care about this person? How could it be interesting? How could you spin it? Yeah. And there's some people that we want to have on. It's just we don't know how to how to integrate that within the existing audience in a way that people want to see. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. And plus, but, probably some people aren't interesting enough for a full podcast. I imagine like they have a thing they can talk about. And- <laughs> That's the thing. Not, yeah, to, yeah. Uh, yeah. not to, but sometimes, yeah, like we do cut episodes short or we can put two people in one episode, yeah, yeah, you sense. know. So tell us for your audience, um, for the audience that isn't familiar with you, I have to say you're one of the few people who I've been so excited to meet. Uh, thank you. Really. Because, I appreciate yeah. that. Because I've been into cars since uh, it was when I saw Lotus Elise. It was 2005 or 2006. I saw Lotus Elise for the first time in Phantom Black, and I thought, that's the Batman car. Yeah. And I was blown away by it. And, and the owner's son gave me a ride in the car, uh, drove me home one day. Oh. And uh, ever since then, I've been obsessed. Oh. So, and you had a Lotus Elise, yeah. I did. I had an Elise. I bought a 2006 chrome orange uh, in San Jose in 2012, and I lived in Atlanta, and I drove it home, and it was the worst week of my entire life, driving from the Bay Area to Atlanta across the country in that car. (laughs) Yeah. You can imagine. You know what's weird is that I bought a chrome orange 2006, also in San Jose. No way. You're kidding. I I kid you not. But it was 2009 when I bought mine. (laughs) <laughs> no way. How, yeah. what, a, what a crazy coincidence. I wonder how many there were. The, the I loved that car. It was cool, yeah. but it was pretty compromised. How did you fit? How tall I are you? Fit Six and foot it was two? fine, but yeah. it wasn't good. Yeah. So like, you know, you're driving through Kansas and you're like, damn. Yeah, you have to be 6'4", <laughs> right? You're not 6'3", yeah. 6'4". Six, 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 and like, it was... It was tough. It was a tough week that week. Yeah. Did, you obviously, you had the top on, right? I so had the top getting on and I had car. to have the hard top on yeah. because mm-hmm. that was the only way, you know, it didn't fit in the car. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I mean, I did the whole trip and my mom joined me. She drove with me from Vegas to Denver where she lives. And like, in retrospect, I'm like, why did that happen? Like, she, it must have been so miserable for her. What a terrible experience. But I did it. And um, that was formative. And honestly, that was before yeah. I did any YouTube. I just did that for fun. Yeah. And it was not fun. <laughs> and especially because there was always a fear it was going to break. And I mean, it was a disaster and that whole thing. But it, the car was fine. I mean, it was yeah. cool. But you know, I mean, car's pretty fragile. It's, you're always a little worried about it. The, the shell is like one big piece. And if you damage it, yeah. it's a whole thing. And I don't know. It wasn't, yeah, it they wasn't call like, it, you have the front clam and yeah. the back clam. Right. It's like two big and pieces. It. It's like, that's yes. it. It's not like cars that have like panels where if you damage one, they replace it. That was like the body. Yeah, the there's car. no bumper. Right. So if you scrape the front of the car, you basically have to replace the entire front of the car in one piece. Which happens like often. Like yeah. people get in minor. I had a buddy who like someone backed into him in a parking lot with one of those tow hitches or something. And that was it. Yeah. That was the clam. Yeah. 
Well, that's why they that. that's why there's so many salvaged lotuses out there. Yeah. You would actually be able to get a good deal. <laughs> would I? Oh, we got to tell you about Jack's car that he just <laughs> bought. We'll make the announcement here. Oh, yeah, wow. Yeah. Okay. But, he uh, a sports car. Oh, he wow. did. Yeah. As a compliment to the 2005 Lexus RX 330. There we go. <laughs> yeah. Well, we uh we have the mom car, uh -huh. right, that I can take like grocery shopping right, and Right, right, right. Then I have the date car. Okay. A 2000 Mazda MX-5 uh, SE. Oh, nice. That's yeah. great. That's awesome. Massive Miata. Fence. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a Miata. Well, we say That's the fancy name. Here, but what you can say is, you know, MX-5 SE, you know. Yeah, MX-5 SE. Yeah, those are great. That's, yeah. that's a great, what color? Uh, it's the, it's like the purple one. The oh, SE, yeah. I think, only comes in yeah, one yeah, yeah. color. What uh, manual? Yes, six speed. Nice, that's yeah. awesome. They're it's great. a great car. It's got some big dents in it, but we're we're smoothing it out right now. The it whole be. point of the car like that is that you can exactly park it, and you know you don't have to worry. Every t you get, you start getting expensive cars, you start really getting nervous. I always tell people the greatest luxury car in the world is a relatively inexpensive car because you I don't ever it. have to think about I it. I don't worry about it. I kind of drive it like a maniac sometimes, but I'm safe. I'm very safe. Yeah, and it's it's a great time. Yeah. So have you ever taken out a luxury car and made a mistake and scratched it up? No, but Never. I w worry about it a lot. And it's interesting because my own daily driver car, I have a brand new Land Rover Defender, which mm -hmm. is a really cool car. And it was expensive, $75,000. Um, and it's scratched and dented to hell already, even though I've only had it 18 months. I drove it across the country four times already. I've done all sorts of crazy off-roading mm -hmm. with it. And I feel like that's the one car. That I feel that I don't have to worry about. <laughs> I love that because my entire life is spent worrying, whether it's my right. own cars or like the cars that I review of people's that are usually very valuable and special. And so it's really nice. The 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 the, the ability to not care is just so nice. And I've been richly rewarded because the market is insane, and that car yeah. is probably worth what I paid, even though I've got so many miles on it and stuff. It's all worked out pretty well. But I know, I know. Yeah, the markup on those cars right now. If you walk into a dealership. They'll be like, well, you could buy one of these, but right. because so many other people want to buy them, uh, you know, 20 grand more. Yeah, my dealer told me yeah. they're asking 25 over. 25. I sticker because I, when I bought yeah. mine, it was kind of a lull. It was the end of 20. This chip shortage thing wasn't a thing. COVID was kind of slowing down. Everybody was like, okay, this is over. They were starting to get to dealers. I, I paid sticker. And I had a couple of buddies that were like, honestly, you should have negotiated. And now it's like. Yeah, okay. you can't. You can't do it. You can't do it at all. So, for those that aren't familiar with your channel, what would you say you do? If you're in an Uber and they say, "What, what do you do, Doc?" If I'm what in an Uber, do? I yeah. lie. <laughs> I'm an attorney. I'm an I do data processing. Yeah, right. <laughs> data entry. I'm not going to get a single follow-up question. But if, if I'm telling like one of my wife's friends, uh, I make YouTube videos. I may review cars. <laughs> don't you? You lie. Well, right? it's I you do. Don't have I that do. I do. I do. Well, it depends who it is. If, if it's someone I'm going to see often, I tell them yeah. the truth. But I never want to say that I'm... I, what do you do? I make YouTube videos. Because oh. everyone, they think pranks. Or, or, or yeah. the, the most common thing is... You make money doing that? Right. The, you make money? Is that your full-time yeah. job? Right. That's so Not only funny. is it my full-time job. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I, um, so anyway, I review cars on YouTube. I have a, I have mostly new cars, but like 80% new cars and 20% old weird cars. And um, I kind of take people on thorough tours of the quirks and features of the cars. That's my thing. <laughs> um, but yeah, God, that's that's the one thing I really, really do not like <laughs> is that conversation. It's too bad it has, it has I don't want to say that like has a reputation like that, <laughs> but anybody over the age of... Even like 35, I would say. 35 starts teetering. Yeah. When you say YouTube, they don't get it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's I live, fascinating. You yeah. guys have very different experiences with that than I do. Because I'm, I'm younger. I just yeah. turned 20, or I didn't just, but and everybody wants I turned to 23. Be a YouTuber. And I say, oh yeah, like if I tell someone I do YouTube, they don't, I never have gotten a follow up. Oh, you can make money doing that? <laughs> right. Yeah. Because my generation, like everyone knows, yeah. you know, that's uh, what a lot of people do want to be. But that's just fascinating. You guys get like, oh, you can make money. Yeah. Doing that. I live in a neighborhood of like mostly older people. Mm -hmm. And. I tell them what I do and they're all like lawyers and, and it's like, the, oh, the questions are unreal. Like, yeah. where can, where can I find your writing? They just assume, oh, I can yeah. review cars. Oh, like in a magazine? No. Cause nobody does that anymore. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> of <course> yeah. <laughs> no, like, it's a blog. Right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just like, it's, it's a, it's an interesting thing. I actually prefer meeting people. And the interactions with people, random people on the street is always an interesting thing. And, and they recognize, I'm sure you get this all the time. Mm. And, and that's always, it's always, I prefer those vastly to the people who don't know and you have to explain it because yes. every explanation is the same and it is like grating. Like yes. to be like, yeah, I make videos. Yeah, here's how it makes money. YouTube, Janet, Google has ads and it's just a whole thing. But it's always interesting to meet normal yeah. people, who fans and things like it's, that. It's interesting in real estate uh, because going through uh, 
and, and now it's less of an issue. But when I first started making like a, a, a decent amount from YouTube and you're going and explaining to uh, mortgage brokers or the underwriter at a bank, how do you make money? They don't get it. Yeah. And I remember trying to explain this to Bank of America. Their underwriter just truly didn't understand. When you were getting I, a home loan, you mean? Or yes. Home, yeah. When I was getting a home loan, I was getting a mortgage, and I was showing that the money was coming in from Google. And I said, so you work for Google. I'm right. like, no, I don't work I for had Google. The, the yeah. exact same time. Really? I'll never forget the question yeah. they asked was, um, do you have a contract? Yes, they asked me the same thing. <laughs> Let me see your employment contract. Yeah, I'm like, it contract. doesn't exist. They're like, but, like, they, like, but they pay you? How much do they pay? Well, it depends how many views. Well, show us the contract that says they'll pay you this much for that much views. <laughs> like, it doesn't exist. It depends on the oh, ad rates. I, like, some months are higher than others. It like, was, that was yeah. the heart, one of the yeah. hardest things I've ever done in my entire yeah. life. Getting a mortgage with this being my career. Fortunately, now I've got a few years of income you can kind of show, and they're like, okay, I, I get it. Yes. But even still, explaining it is like a complete disaster. That's funny they asked you for a contract. contract. I thought like maybe it was a one-off thing. They don't deal with it that often. I mean, I yeah. assume, I think that they, when you, they see a 1099 person, they assume that you have a contract because yeah. you're a contractor. And so they, but like, I just don't get how they don't get it. Like, I, of course I think that because mm -hmm. this is my world and I, I'm like, how could you not know? But a lot of people don't know. My parents yeah. still don't understand it. So. Yeah. Same when I come back to LA every now and then I'll visit um, the, the old real estate office, not the Oppenheim group, but before that a Coldwell Banker. And a lot of those agents were like 50s and 60s. And they kind of, some of them knew about YouTube, some of them didn't. But every now and then when I do see them, they'll ask something along the lines of, uh, you still making videos? <laughs> is that still, still doing that? Yeah. You still doing that vlog yeah, thing? Like, or yeah, as, it, as though it's like some passing thing. <laughs> it's like, oh yeah, no, I'm over that. Here's a question for you. Yeah. People come up to me all the time in the street and ask for car advice or tell me they bought a car because of me or whatever. Do people come up to you and ask for financial advice? All the time. Really? All the time. What is the conversation going to be like? I am shocked uh, how quickly people open up about, uh, really? yeah, within 10 seconds, I know their net worth, how much they're <laughs> making, uh, what their credit score is, what they're invested in. I mean, they will tell me their, their entire financial life, 10 seconds, and I get a good idea of like what's going on. But because it's so personal, it'll they'll open up to so many other things as well. Like, you know, I quit my job at this. I'm doing this thing right now. My net worth went up 30% because I was invested in this. And I'm doing this right now. What do you recommend? It's always, <laughs> what, do you, what do you recommend? What do you tell people? What do you recommend? These are conversations you have in the street, like in the airport. Yes. What do you um, tell people? It's, it's buying you give it's, them it's, the usually, stuff it's usually that he would say on his YouTube videos. Yeah, so you like yeah. provide, you don't, be, you don't say like. Entertainment purposes only, granted. Right. But yes. Yeah, yeah. You, you don't say like, this is an insane conversation. Like, that's no. what I would think. I'd no, be like, no, no, no. I'm happening? so used to it. No, yeah, I'm, I'm sure. into it. It's weird for me. And, uh, and sometimes Macy's, uh, my girlfriend has to pull me back sometimes because like, I'll be introduced and I'll be like, yeah, so, so how much you make last year? <laughs> and, uh, I'll be like, so how much of that did you save? And, uh, and sometimes it just comes up like, so what's your net worth? And it's so common for me because right. everyone that I talk that to socially, you can't just ask yeah, people, tell it to people that you're meeting. And like, everybody that I talk to is like, oh yeah, no, no, it's, uh, yeah, my net worth right now is 5.4 and I'm, but that's what I'm interested. I like. I'm really curious about that. Yeah. It's not, you know, it, there's nothing other than just, just genuine curiosity. So, <laughs> for me, it's normal, and I appreciate it because right. it's what I would want to know. Yeah, but yeah. it's not normal. Right, right. But, Another pretty yeah. common occurrence, like if you meet a fan, is that for Graham, like they'll just go up and open up their wallet and show Graham all of Other their credit, credit cards. cards. So just like, what do you think about this? I have yeah. this one that does this. This one that does this. Makes you so <laughs> proud. They always pull out the Discover. It's secured. They're like, this is my first credit card. I because I watched your video four years ago and I got it. I still use it today. And then they pull out the city double cash. They're like, then I use this one on it, and then they'll pull out the Amex, be like, I booked a, a you know plane oh. ticket on this. Interesting. So it's cool. That's amazing. I, I love it's that. It's nice to be able to have that effect. And I have people every day. I had a guy this morning, Cars and Coffee, come to me and say, Yeah, you know, I bought whatever it was because of you. Now it's becoming I bought whatever it was on Cars and Vids. Like I literally bought the car on your site, which is there's some pride. And then you're like, okay, I hope you had a good experience. But there's some pride there. Like it's, yeah. it's I get it. It's like kind of a cool thing. Yeah. Um it is weird. The few times I've had to do fine, the, what I've done finance videos, like the comments, I think that the car community and the finance community are not necessarily hand in hand. I think if you're into cars and into finance, you are in that space. But a lot of car people just like have like no financial sense at all. I did a video about how in today's market, with interest rates being what they I are, saw it. you should finance yes. instead of pay cash, which is like to me a no brainer. Automakers are offering, you know, 1% loan. I mean, it's insane. Of course mm -hmm. you should. Every rational person yeah. would. And oh my God, the comments. You read the comments? People are like, I didn't, I, yeah. some people are like, I would never buy a car, finance a car. When I pay cash, one of the comments that had like 400 thumbs up was like, when I pay cash, it feels realer. 
And I'm like, mm. <laughs> it, it, it's it's difficult because uh, there's there's a big psychological aspect that's, of that of like it yeah is, it's a it's a psychological thing and I but I try to explain to people that's not necessarily the best decision and I think people get like angry that it's you, too nuanced yeah so sometimes in in stuff like that you have to go with the majority of of when you buy a car like that you should just pay it off in cash because it's easier for people to understand unless people could get hurt right and by I was that clear and that's the, video. the thing i was it's careful like, in the video to be like this yeah. only works if you can have access to really low interest rates and if you have the money and you're not stretching and all that and i think that a lot of people realize that they might get into trouble if they just started going out and financing stuff and I so know. My, the video was intended to be about if you can pay with cash that's probably when you shouldn't you know but um but boy did that <laughs> it's horrible. yeah i and Personal finance like that is so thick. One of my most viewed videos was whether or not you should get a 15 or 30 year mortgage. And that was one of my first videos that I made. And I've never seen people so divisive on 30 versus 15. And there are some people who are, were just so adamant that no, you want to pay it off in 15 years because then you're paying a smaller amount of interest, even though the interest is over 30 years. And, and mathematically, it makes right. sense to take the, take the 30 sure. year. But sometimes you just have to feed into the psychological aspect that and honestly, people like having something paid off. Of yeah. it. And, and if that's how they feel, then I guess that's what they should do. Because if they're simply not going to be convinced, and if the psychological aspect plays that much of a thing, and if they won't be able to sleep at night, yeah, such is life. Yeah, when I bought the uh, the Ford GT, I paid for that in cash. And that when was one of the things. Uh, that was a year ago. Okay. A year ago, I paid cash for it. But the, the reason was I, I inquired to one person to get a loan or one, one company to get a loan and they wanted so much documentation that I was like, it's just, I don't want to go through that, that loan process. Yeah. yeah. It's horrible. Yeah. I, I so yeah. recently bought a house and it was such a hellish process that I now, like I, for a long time, why would anybody pay cash for a house with interest rates that they are? After that, I now kind of realize <laughs> like if you can, and if it's, if you're worth 50 yeah. million in a $2 million house, you just write a check. Maybe it makes some sense. You just don't have to go through all that crap. And when did you buy a house? Uh, I bought a house here in San Diego in 19. Wow. So, okay, so good time in, in well, hindsight, it out actually. To be a good time, but it's interesting yeah. because we bought the house. We paid the highest price per square foot in the neighborhood, and everybody thought we were nuts. It's not, they're not thinking that right now. Yeah. <laughs> when, <laughs> when in 2019? Do you Beginning, need to like start of the year. Okay. Yeah. That was a good time to buy because 2018, the, the, the Fed started raising rates yep. and the real estate market softened right. a little bit. Yeah. And that was one of the few times where things started going down all, just yeah. barely. And, we, we, and we, we were under contract on the same house in 2018 for more money. And we ended up buying the house for less money when it went back on the market in 19. So it worked out well. And most importantly, obviously, things have gone nuts. And, and San Diego is one of the markets where they've especially gone nuts. This, it's absolutely I've been out of control. It's one of the highest increases. Um, and boy, is it insane. But it's insane everywhere. Yeah. Yeah, you're probably up 25%. I was just going to ask, is yeah. that your only property? Yeah, um, it is. But yeah, I think 25%, yeah, which yeah. is insane. Did it? We, were, we yeah. thought it was inflated then, and everybody else yeah, did no. too. All of our neighbors were like, this is insane. Nobody should pay this. Did you worry when COVID hit that like you had just bought a house, you had a business that was online reviewing people's cars? <laughs> was Because yeah. I remember when I, I bought a house... The month before COVID, it was the most expensive. <laughs> I went from a du an 800 square foot duplex to a $2 million house in Santa Monica. And the month after COVID hit, yeah. and I remember I had sponsors all of a sudden in March sort of backing out and say, we want, we want to see what happens, see how this plays out. Ad revenue yep. dropped substantially. Yep. I was like, oh crap. I got in just terrible timing. I was like, you know what? What, what can I do? You got to. Yeah. I think that the, the key is, and you know this, and you probably advocate for this, you got to spend less than you can, you know, in case stuff goes bad. And that was yeah. my big thing. Um, no, I wasn't that concerned. But yeah, when COVID hit, it was tough just generally. I mean, it, you just didn't know what was going to happen. And I was really worried because we were trying to get pregnant throughout all of 20. We had a couple of miscarriages and we were pregnant when COVID hit. And the, the outcome for women with who are pregnant with COVID was not known. And it was, since it has become known, it actually is, turns out not to be all that good. And so we've always been more cautious than we, than I want to be. Um, and so, like, I don't want to go to car, like, dealerships, which are, like, the most conservative organizations. Yeah. Like, those guys are, like, no mask policy, no masks. And I was nervous about all that, for sure. Um, and so that aspect was the thing that, that's, that worried me the most. Like, doing these videos with people. Like, this video here would not have been even conceivable during yep. the start of COVID. Like, no, we, were, we were washing pairs with 
individual wet wipes. Like, do you remember that world? Like, of co- like everyone yeah. was terrified of everything. Delivery is it? Oh safe? yeah, yeah. Like Leaving the packages thing? outside <laughs> for like two days <laughs> right. just to just to bring it inside because you didn't know. Well, that? you didn't, you didn't know. know. You, you didn't, didn't know. know at the time. Right. Yeah. Exactly. And so I was scared more less about the channel because I kind of thought it would come back. And honestly, I could I could get a big drop in ad revenue and still be okay. I was more worried about like physically going to dudes' houses and like meeting them and that whole thing. yeah. Um, when you make content though, how much of a backlog do you have? It depends. I, we spend every summer on the East coast and I don't film. And so you got to get a backlog to do that. Like a serious. So by the time the summer rolls around, like in June, I usually have like 25 videos, wow. which for me, cause I only put up two main, like two main videos every week. That's two and a half months, but you got to have it. If, if you want to do that, that's the one problem with YouTube. You can't really take a vacation. Like there's no breaks. Wow. What so do you, do? you must have a similar. Yeah, so I'm always two videos ahead on the main channel. Okay, I'm usually a week ahead on the second channel. Wow. Uh, the I this this podcast we're what three weeks ahead? Right now we're three weeks ahead. But Don't you? Usually it's like one week to just yeah. current, and then vlogs wow. are just those are easy. Quick I'll spend turnover. twenty. I'll spend twenty minutes trying. What to do vlog. you do when you take vacations? Then, I don't. Only- you don't take vacations. You can't. I uh, I took the first vacation in five years to Hawaii for five days, and it took me a week. A week of working probably 12 to 14 hour days to get five days off. But first, I want to thank our sponsor, Huel. Alex, I'm so hungry, but I don't have the time to make a healthy meal. I guess it's fast food again. Jack, don't settle for unhealthy fast food. Get healthy food fast with Huel. Huel is a meal supplement with all the essential proteins, carbs, fats, fibers, and 27 other essential vitamins and minerals. I've noticed that without proper nutrition, I become unproductive and just feel bad. And that's why I consider Huel an investment. Not only can it save me time for work, it makes the time I do spend working actually matter. Just mix their plant-based powder with water and you'll feel fantastic and more efficient for the rest of your day. So recently I've been working out more, as you can probably tell, and I've been drinking Huel Black Edition, which has way more protein and way fewer carbs to help me get these insane gains. Huel also has hot and savory meals, which include mac and cheese, Thai green chili, and a few others you have to try. Huel is proof that fast food can be good food. I love it, and I know you will too. And right now, you can get free shipping on your first order, plus a shaker and a free t-shirt when you go to huel.com slash ICH. That's H-U-E-L dot com slash I-C-H for free shipping, a shaker, and a t-shirt. Thank you so much, Huel, and back, back to, to the, the podcast. podcast. Do you think that there should be some sort of vacation compensation from YouTube? I've thought about this a lot. Like, there's, I didn't get paternity <laughs> leave, you know? Like, yeah. in a job, you would. And there's no, like, advocate for YouTubers. Because, like, they were making all this money, they're oh, stupid, they're... yeah. Like, and so like, I, but I sit here and think like, is there something to be said for maybe having YouTube be like, look, you can take two weeks a year. We'll give you the average of your last two weeks ad rev. And like, I get obviously why they yeah. don't do it. And if you do that, they start to run into some legal issues because right. of your employee at that point. But by not doing it, think about that. You don't have to take a vacation in five years, yeah. except when you did one five day one, it took that much work. Like. There's, there's a middle ground that should I think it's happen. more so algorithm based. Like, I don't care about the finances at all. It's yeah. purely just, you will I come back? Yep. Is the algorithm going to be the same? And if I've spent five years working to yep. perfect the algorithm, is taking a week off going to ruin that? Yep. And I wish if there was like a pause button where they could be like, you could pause this and come back in 30 days and your algorithm will be exactly the That's same. That's an interesting point. I would do that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I would love Take to do some that. Day, January right. when the rad rev's not that good. Take right. Some yeah. But it's always that worry when you come back. Uh, is it going to we'll, be there? Yeah. And also with, with the content that, that I do on the main channel, a lot of it is news-based. So it's like yeah. whatever happened the day before, I have to talk about the next day. Yeah. And I know some days where something will happen. And unless I talk about that specific thing, no matter what I post is going to bomb. Yeah. And then it's going to throw off the next video. Interesting. So I have to. Certain days I'm like, if I don't talk about this... I cannot. It's better for me not to post. Interesting. So I'll have to talk about that that one thing. Huh? How about that? Yeah. So I guess that makes sense. But it's a it's a grind. It's fascinating to me because your videos, the production quality doesn't seem to be like 
something out of this world. It's very right. simple. You, like you said, right. you shoot on your iPhone and you use, I think you said a camcorder. Yeah. So, <laughs> and also the editing isn't that crazy either. Right. So what's, how, how much time lapses between shooting the video and then the video being ready to post? Uh, it depends on the car. The brand new cars, you got you to get them up like immediately. And sometimes mm -hmm. you have to get them up immediately because you're, there's a press embargo. <laughs> but for older car videos, they, they, mm -hmm. it takes longer. Um, it, they're not relevant. You got to get the new ones up while it's hot. It's the same reason you want to post news content. Yeah. Like you got to get it up while people are interested in it. So like Ford Bronco Raptor has got to go up right away. And I got, I got videos I shot over a year ago that are still waiting to go up because they're cars from the 80s. And if mm -hmm. I post it today or if I post it in a year, mm -hmm. it's not going to get more or less views. So you just hold those. And how yeah. much time is demanded for each process of making a YouTube video, whether that be filming, editing, traveling, random stuff like that. Um, and it's, also it's a couple hours to, it's a couple hours to research the car, and write the script. Yeah. Filming is about four or five hours. And then the editing process thing takes Nick about four hours. Mm -hmm. Um, and then there's travel. So mm -hmm. like I flew to Michigan to shoot this Bronco Raptor. That's a, that's long. Yeah. You gotta be in Michigan in the winter, you know. <laughs> and do you generally do multiple takes per shot or is it pretty like seamless and flowing? Um, it depends like the mood I'm in and like mm -hmm. food I had that morning, yeah. you know, like how I'm feeling. I'm mm -hmm. sure this is the same. It's the same yeah. way with me. Some days I wake up and I know this is a yep. good filming day. Yep. For whatever yep. reason, I'm like, I say everything perfectly. Yep. It goes so smoothly. My energy's there. Totally. Other days I mispronounce everything. everything. And then you gotta start it. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's interesting. I don't know why that is. I don't yeah. get that. But there are days where you are where you just know even before yep. you start like this is going to be two hours. I'll get a whole yeah. video film, and sometimes it's like, well, I've been here six hours, <laughs> I'm still not through this. But yeah, that's an odd yeah. one. I wonder why. How do you keep so? It seems like you're very just calm, relaxed, easygoing. Have you always been like that? Yeah, I guess. Really? I don't know. I think yeah. You get stressed? Uh, yeah, yeah. There's a lot. <laughs> what do you? What stresses you, you know, out? The problem yeah. when you got. This is the, the benefit of yeah. having the channel with, with no employees. You don't, you're not beholden to anybody. But now I got like, the cars and bids, I got like 14, 15 people depending on my continued success. Yeah. And that's stressful. So don't you think like having employees is like mm -hmm. a stressful thing? I, I mean, I obviously, I like Jack and Alex, but I can't imagine having more people. Right. And I've always just been the type where I, I would just do everything myself. Yeah. So it's just, yeah. it's, there's, there's benefit to it. And also you don't, you're not like behold, like knowing that people with families are like depending right. on you. That's like some, Jack is, I, I view it differently. Yeah. Jack so, is the opposite. I, I'm not the opposite. <laughs> I, I do believe in outsourcing <laughs> things that don't necessarily need to be done. And also I do think if you're constantly doing things that you don't like to do, yeah. it's going to make your work that's true. a lot more difficult. No, I, and I, it's going to be like a sprint instead of a marathon. That's and you exactly have to right. prepare and, yourself. Yeah, I'm so glad I outsourced editing yeah. for that exact reason. But well, think yeah. about it this way. The way I like to view it is a lot of the times what makes people nervous about editing or, or hiring more people is the fact that you have to find people that are perfect fits and train yeah. them up and stuff like that. But think about it this way. If you could, if you could hire someone, cause you said your editor is fantastic, right? And they were as diligent and responsible and, uh, as much of a go-getter as your editor, would you hire another person if they were just like that person, yeah, but, but they wanted to help out in another way? It's impossible to find those people because no, those not. people are already but, employed and doing great things. Right. And I'm stuck with, it's very difficult to find those people. But if you could, would oh, you? Oh yeah, 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 sure. And you said during your interview with Graham for the main channel that you thought it was impossible to outsource your editing, right? Yeah. But then how many people did it go, Did you have to go through to no, find this just, person? No, just the guy, just the one dude. Just the first person, right? <laughs> okay, you make an interesting point. At this point, I don't really need anybody else. But that's what we did with Cars and Bits. I, mm -hmm. There were so many things I did not want to give up. Mm -hmm. I was like, no, I'm going to set all the reserves. Well, that became stupid. We get 80 cars submitted mm -hmm. a day. I'm not going to set all the reserves. Um, like, I want to be the final word on what the... I want to edit every listing. That was for the first couple of weeks. Right. Mm -hmm. That's not real. <laughs> That's game unfeasible. And so we d I've learned over the last year that, like, yes, it can be useful to outsource some of this stuff. And I also am a big, big, big believer in specializing. Mm -hmm. And so, like, my thing is, like, I'm good at making the videos. I should make the videos. <laughs> And other people are good at other stuff. And that's probably what I should. Like, I got a, I got a guy who t does my grass, you know, my, my garden, my lawn. Mm -hmm. He's See, good you, at that. If you feel like you're balanced and you're at a point where you could do this for yeah. 15, 20 years, that's totally fine. And you probably have ample employees and you're, you're good to go. Yeah. So, yeah. But I'm not like the, the type that's like, oh, yeah, hire aimlessly. Just start uh, hiring and bring a board. Jack got an intern. 
So Jack An has an intern as his assistant. Uh, Jack has you a tool. I'm paying you, him. You, you, Jack has two people working underneath yes. him. Nice. <laughs> yeah. So, so you, and it, uh, is, yeah. it, it has improved my work life balance. Yeah. Dramatically. I think it that what a lot of people don't understand so much is that uh, there is a benefit to the the work life balance is a. I've learned this as I've gotten older. Initially, my whole goal was making money. Mm -hmm. And like succeeding and excelling. I didn't come from a lot of money. I never was in a situation where I had any money, truthfully. I mean, we were comfortable, but my we never like were, I didn't know anybody with super car. Like mm -hmm. that wasn't a thing. And it was nice to do that. And then I started to realize what would also be nice is to enjoy some of it and to take a vacation, you know. And outsourcing, I think, was a smart decision. And honestly, now things have equalized to the point. We've hired enough of cars and bids. I could take back the editing if I wanted to and probably still be okay. But I'm not gonna, because right. I have a kid, and it's he's it's kind of cool, and I have Noodle, and I have like my cars I want to drive, mm -hmm. and my friends, and there's something to that. It's worth spending whatever the editor costs every year to have to be able proper to work life, life balance, yeah. and to be able to continue to do however you're doing yeah. for the next. But 10, see, but you, you mentioned the vacation thing. I don't know. For me, it feels like work is the vacation. Like I enjoy. Like That's to great. me, like this would be. The vacation. That's like, great. This is my little vacation. That's a great. Yeah. That's a great position to be in. I feel the same about both work and actual vacations. But that's the best position to be in because yeah, you enjoy what you do. You never you never work a day yeah, in your life, true. right? That's yeah. like the stupid meme, but it's like kind of true. Yeah. And there are a lot of people who have jobs that suck. Yeah. But Jack outsourced. Uh, I'm I'm just gonna say you're <laughs> say it. Oh boy. You're, you're Jack outsourced his Tinder. Okay. Well, that's, that <laughs> is, I didn't know you were going to say that. <laughs> what did you think it was going to say? I thought you were going to say, I don't know, like cleaning or something like that. But, but yeah, so, I, well, I guess I have to elaborate now. But yeah, I hired a personal assistant and this person's basically here to just relieve me of the certain things that I have to do on a day-to-day -day basis. And obviously, I, I, well, not obviously, but I bought a house back in October. With the house, there were a lot of things wrong with it and I have to talk with contractors and I want to put solar on, replace an AC unit do all of this stuff, but I've, I realized if I have a lot of stuff going on, like a lot of smaller tasks, it takes my mind away from the big stuff I should be focusing on. So I figured it was but worth Tinder, it. Tinder, triple worth life balance, that's life. That's it. Find no, I did, not hire, I did not hire someone out to swipe for me on Tinder. No, I, I still swipe for myself on Tinder. And if I've matched with anyone watching this right now, it is it me talking you, right? to you. It is me. But uh, no, I, I uh, basically, I lost my Tinder account. And uh, when I changed phones and I got him to submit a ticket for me and basically. Go oh, okay. the, well, that's that's easy. Easy. Yeah, it's, <laughs> I was sitting there thinking you got, you like told the dude, all right, look, I like this type of person. No, no, no. I still swipe. <laughs> that's like, you know. If so. you could create a bot though, that does facial recognition that knows like generally your preference and yeah. will automatically swipe. But that there's would be more incredible. to it though. Like it's not just the face. <laughs> like the bot would also have to like no corny jokes in the profile, you know? Yeah. That sort of thing. But uh, yeah, that would actually be interesting to outsource your Tinder. My friends and I were just talking the other day. There, There is a race series with Ferraris that you mm -hmm. call the Ferrari Challenge Series where you buy a Ferrari Challenge race car and then you drive. They, there's like uh, every weekend basically throughout the summer, there's like a race series uh, where you race your challenge car against other people who have these cars. And obviously it's very wealthy people who do this. And now some of the guys who do this have hired a driver. So they're not even racing the car themselves because they want to win so bad. And that's like the ultimate like CEO move is yeah. to outsource your leisure time. <laughs> you're not even getting the enjoyment of using the challenge car. They're literally watching someone else use it so they can win. And that is a good example of this, I guess. Oh, my gosh. So how much free time would you say you have now? Um... Night, nights and weekends tend to be to be pretty free. I do a little bit more traveling for work than I would like to at the current moment, and I don't think that's going to stop. And so sometimes on a Saturday I'll be gone for that, or a, a night I'll be away. Um, but I've tried to focus really on um, kind of get, combining everything into a typical work day, which yeah. is longer than most people's. I guess I work from like 6 to 6, um, but that's it. There's no night, like evenings I have with my family and weekends I generally yeah. hang out. Have you been surprised with the growth of the channel so far? Yeah. I have been surprised since day one. I don't understand. <laughs> Do you? <laughs> Can you explain oh, yeah, it yeah, to no, me? yeah. <laughs> well, with the, with the other channels, not so much now, but yeah, the, no, the main channel is the yeah. one that, yeah, it I never would have imagined. I, I don't get why... Um, yeah, it, it is surprising, and it's surprising to me that you can do this. I remember when I was in college, I, I'm curious to hear your original thoughts about YouTube before mm -hmm. you started doing this, because when I was in college, they were, you heard about this guy, PewDiePie, who made a lot of money on mm -hmm. YouTube, and it was like this, 
okay, but I'm going to get a job and have like a life, mm-hmm. a normal life. And then like it started happening and it's like, I can't believe this is, this is something that's happening, especially to me and probably to you because like some of our colleagues like wanted to be YouTubers and have always been kind of dramatic or fashionable or whatever. And so this is a rational next step for them. But like, isn't it weird when you think about what you do based on like your background or your, like that this is my career? Yeah. I don't know. It's, it's a, it's just what I've enjoyed talking about though. Yeah. So from, but when I started, there was no one else really talking about personal finance. I mean, it was weird to be like, I'm talking about credit cards today, guys. But what really said it for me was when, uh, do you remember, you probably maybe watched him, Rob Dom. Yeah. Yeah. He had a yellow Lamborghini Diablo. And right around that time, I think that was like 2011, 2012, he posted a how he was able to afford a Lamborghini Diablo. And I watched that video and I found it so inspiring. I wanted to be like Rob Dom. And he was filming in his garage. And I'm like, if I could be able to do that, hmm. uh, that, that, that was it. And I just knew it. And I messaged Rob Dom on Facebook. And I was just like, I didn't know what to say. So I was like, oh, what camera do you use? Like, just like the normal stuff, just to strike a conversation. And he got back to me. And I was st- like, I think at the time he had maybe 15,000 subscribers. Oh. And I was like, oh, what? Like, this was a big deal for me to see his resp- uh, response. And we went back and forth on, uh, on Facebook. And I asked him, I said, hey, listen, I think if you just, if you continue giving business advice like this, you're going to blow up. No, because no one else is doing this. And if if you just gave business advice and practical advice on how to buy a car like that, and you just keep doing that, it, it, it's a huge industry. No one else is doing it. And he got back to me and he said, "No, I just I'm just doing it for fun, and I just enjoy talking about the car every now and then. Yeah. I don't want to keep yeah. doing this. It's just you know a one off kind of thing." Which is true. Which is yeah. remain true for him. Like he Correct. seems to do it as like a hobby yeah. purely. And yeah. But, and so you saw this opportunity. Yes. Yeah. As soon as he did that, I was like, well, if he's not doing it, I wanted to do it. But that was 2011 or 12. And I never had the courage. I'm like, well, he has a Lamborghini. I, I don't have a Lamborghini. Like, why would someone care about what I have to say? Right. So I just didn't. I just, it's just didn't. perfect timing, though, for you. Because, like, personal finance and taking control of budgeting and that sort of thing has become, like, a really hot, mm-hmm. in the, especially in the last few years, I yeah. feel like. I, maybe it was when I was a kid and I just wasn't aware of it. But I feel like the internet has given rise to, like, this huge culture of investing personal finance kind of thing. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to figure out if, it, like, where was the catalyst to that? Because I remember when I started in 2017, uh, I was late 2016, it wasn't a thing. Yeah. And part of me thinks that maybe it was a bit of the Chase Sapphire Reserve came out. And that's what I kind of noticed that everyone was like, get the Chase Sapphire Reserve, we're going to get the points, we're going to get free yeah. stuff. Maybe that got people yeah. into it. Or maybe it was the fact that, you know, we had a recession. Yeah. Uh, people coming of age after graduating Wanted were like now know. trying to figure yeah. out their finances. And maybe that was like a shift. Yeah. But for me, I just always was into it. And I yeah. didn't have friends in person that I could talk to about credit cards and personal finance. So I'd spend hours on Reddit. Yeah. In the financial uh, independent subreddit and personal finance. Yeah. Just, just answering questions and just going yeah. back and forth. So yeah. I thought that like, oh, maybe if I could talk about this on YouTube, someone might find it interesting, but no one else was really doing it. Yeah. Are there a bunch of people now doing it? Oh gosh. Yeah. yeah. There's, there's, it's weird because in the beginning it was maybe five of us and uh, there's a channel beat the bush. We actually were, were fortunate enough to have him come on and he was, he's very silly. He doesn't do any collapse. Uh, this was the first time he's ever done a podcast, but he was the one that I looked to back then yeah. because he was making videos about financial independence and retiring early. And I remember back then he'd get like 5,000 views. So I thought, well, if he could get 5,000 views, I know that at least there's 5,000 people out there who would want to hear it. That's good enough for me. So it <laughs> came from that when very few people were doing it. 5,000. That was 5, the number. 000, yeah. <laughs> if I get 5,000 views, uh, there was another guy. Uh, his name was Brian Casella. He had 15, 10 or 15,000 subscribers uh, giving advice as a real estate agent. And so I looked at him and I said, well, if he's giving advice as an agent, I know uh, I could probably get 15,000 subscribers if I did the content as good as his or better. And so that, this, that was kind of how I viewed that. It made me feel comfortable about jumping in because at least I'm not the only one. And there's a few other people doing it too. It's amazing to think back yeah. that it was that it was like the frontier. It was, back but then. it's it's interesting because now it seems like oh, in hindsight, yeah, it would have been easy. But it's weird because it's shifting back to niche topics. Like back then, 
you couldn't really do niche topics because no one would care. Yeah. But then now as I've grown bigger, you have to be more broad and general. And so now it's the niche cha- the niche channels that are coming back up. Interesting. The people who because talk about so many people are now watching this that if you have something that directed that no one else is talking about, you can. Exactly. Yeah. Like I couldn't make a video breaking down, uh, I don't know, Tesla stock. There's too just much. Say. Yeah, exactly. It's too niche and it just, it wouldn't appeal to a mass audience. Yeah. So there's a huge demographic out there who just wants Tesla stock. Yeah. Or just wants the analysis on one type of. How interesting. Yeah. Huh. So it's kind of shifting back. And yeah. those are the channels now that are that are kind of growing a little bit more. Interesting. Uh, same Interesting. with cryptocurrency. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Crypto is everything right now. Yeah. Right? Do Interesting. You, do you own any crypto? No, but I totally think it's a reasonable thing. And I just, I probably should have a long time ago done it. Um, three years ago, I would have said it was like the stupidest scam BS in the world. But some people who I take seriously take crypto seriously. And so to me, it's like a, a fairly reasonable thing. Do you, I assume you do. Yes, yeah. I do. So I was the exact same as you. Uh, I thought crypto was the biggest waste of money. I was like, you can't value it. Right. And so I'm like, well, the value is only in what someone else is willing to pay for it. I don't want to put my money in that. Yeah. But over time, um, same as you, the more people took it seriously, the more I was like, well, maybe I should give this a chance. Yeah. And once I jumped in, I was like, I saw the appeal. Yeah. So right now, I think crypto's down. So I think I'm about 5 to 6% of my entire portfolio is crypto. Yeah. So yeah, that seems like a healthy. I would do it, not financial advice, absolutely. But <laughs> but but for if for good entertainment, you should buy <laughs> you should buy one Bitcoin and ten Ethereum for f- a lot of fun. Yeah, and just that's it. Just put it to the side. Don't look at it. Yeah, yeah. one Bitcoin, ten Ethereum. I just I'm more of a traditional guy, but. Bitcoin is rapid, or, or crypto in general is rapidly becoming more traditional than I ever would have expected five years ago. Some people were way out ahead of that, and I wish I had been, of course, like every investment. But I've been out ahead of some other stuff. The mm-hmm. cars have all done incredibly well. So that's like, that, again, specializing. Like, I kind of knew what I thought would go up in value, and look what, look what happened. <laughs> you know, it yeah. all worked out. Would you be comfortable talking about different percentages and how, how like different asset classes reflect your portfolio? Um, yeah. You don't have to disclose numbers, but just I don't, percentages. Offhand, I don't quite know as much, um, but I feel like I have a good, I have probably more than I ought to in the, in the market, um, just mostly in index funds and stuff. And I think that the, I say more than I ought to, even though it's probably half of maybe a little more, but I, I graduated college in 10 mm-hmm. and Nobody who graduated college in 10 trusts the stock market. <laughs> it just doesn't occur. Like everybody thinks that, look, we all lived through that. I remember sitting there watching in college, I was a senior or a junior and like Bear Stearns is collapsing and Lehman is collapsing. And I'm sitting there thinking, the market is not safe. I'm never going to get a job. <laughs> like, I'm screwed. Yeah. And so like, even still to this day, I remember back then that cash was a big deal. If you had cash in 09, you were, you were king. Yeah. And I rem- I've thought ever since then, like, I still need to hold some cash. And I have, and probably more, which is funny because I'm over here thinking that Stradman's insane for doing it. And I probably hold more than I should. Um, but I, yeah, if there's ever another 09, I want to I wanna be able to buy it at 40. You know? Yeah. <laughs> the problem is you won't. When it happens, you're scared. Yeah. That's, that's what happened at the start of 20. Like, everything went down and I was like. You freeze. Froze. I was yeah. like, I've got the cash. I could do something. And instead, I was like, I'm not buying anything in this market. This yeah, too scary. it was interesting, Jack. Actually, I think you and I went for, we used to, because Jack lived with, uh, he lived in the guest house right when COVID hit. And uh, I think it was March or April, we were taking a run. And I had a whole bunch of cash sitting on the sidelines, a whole bunch. Now, I didn't sell out of anything. It's just, I was saving up to buy a property. And when the stock market fell, I was telling Jack, man, should I just dump it all in the markets? <laughs> And I, I couldn't, I mean, that would have been the right thing to in do, but, uh, but the problem I dollar way, cost averaged, I think beginning late March, early April, which is, is, which is yeah. probably not as smart, but in retrospect, but it could have been because in 08, yeah. in 08, there was a drop like that and you could have dumped everything in mm-hmm. and there was a lot more drop to come. And that's, that was my fear. And that's why in order to actually capitalize when the market is down, you got to have, you got to be willing to take some risk. Yeah. And I'm just. I'm not like there anymore mentally. And if I never own an F40, even if it gets cheap again, then so be it. <laughs> yeah. Like in that That's mindset. why it's so much easier, at least for me, just to keep buying. Yeah. And so I have a, I have a routine every single morning. I wake up now and I check uh, my account 
and I buy it before I get out of bed. Yeah. And I buy the same amount every single day. Yeah. And then I scroll through the individual stocks. I'm like, if one is down or one looks like really good that day, I'll buy a little bit for fun. Yeah. But the majority of it is just S&P. And then I'm buying 10, 10 to 20% sometimes international, depending on how that's doing. Yeah. How much is it per day that you buy? 6000 probably. 6000 a day. Yeah. Mm. When do you cash out? This is what <laughs> I started I to think about. Like, yeah. We've been thinking about make, adding an addition to our house. And I don't want to sell anything. Yeah. Least I. It's all No, I'm off. not. Yeah, yeah. But at the same time, it's like, isn't this what I'm investing for? Like, isn't this kind of thing what I'm investing for? And I don't know what yeah. to do about that. And you could make the same argument with cars. Like, I wouldn't mind another cool car, but I'm not going to sell. But at the same time, it's like, what if I died? And was like, damn, I had all this money in the market like an idiot. <laughs> you know? It's a, that's, yeah. Right now, I'm starting to come to terms more with that. Initially, it was like, I need to get some investments like 10 years ago. And now it's like, okay, I have them. Now what? <laughs> like, what do I do? Yeah, I look at the dividends. So it's funny. I don't look at the overall return. I just go, uh, on mine, there's there's like a little thing that you could go to. It scrolls to show your estimated revenue with dividends. Yeah. And so I only look at that. Yeah. I'm like, well, you know, regardless of what the stocks are going to be doing, I know I'm going to be getting about that. Yeah. So that's kind of what I think yeah, of yeah, mentally. Yeah. yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. And so it's fun because every day you invest you watch that number go up just a little bit. And I'm like, wow, you know, today I got an extra 20 bucks. Yeah. I, I love that feeling. Yeah. Even if it's like $10, I'm like, yeah. what can I buy with $10? Well, if I, you know, over two days, that's uh, sushi. Right. So like every other day now I get an extra sushi. Right. So I, I find that fun. You actually reinvest the dividends. Probably. I reinvest them. Right. All. Yeah. So it, really, <laughs> yeah, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I could choose not to. I mean, right. it's a little check of a button. Right. You choose yeah, not yeah, to. Yeah. But right. but no, right. I, I reinvest all of that. Right. Right. I don't know. It's an interesting thing. I also, I feel the same way and I, and I invest not every day, but I have a month, number every month or whatever it is and put in and, and I always have. And, but at some point I'm just like. Am I missing out on stuff I should be doing like on a day to day level? Because I <laughs> crypto dollar cost average so much apparently. In, but like like stuff I should be buying, travel I should be doing or whatever because I've put so much money in the market. Like this year I told my wife, I was like, I don't know if I want to do this house edition. I'd rather invest. And she's like, we need, like, we got to live. Like, I was like, yeah, but you know, it's, it's pretty nice. To- you could always create like a uh, like a fund on the side and say, okay, well, 5% is going into this fund and when we have enough money, then we're going to do that, that house remodel. the numbers for what tens of uh, $10,000, $5,000, whatever put in is in when we're 60. Yes. It's just so hard not to. It's yeah. so hard not to. That's why I've really prioritized like saving and investing now because the the opportunity cost yeah. before 40 Massive. is a lot. Okay, but here's yeah. a question. You love work. Yeah. So like isn't it kind of BS? Like you're not you're going to want to work forever. Yeah, so but at the you, end of the day, even when you're 60 and it's a lot of money, you're still going to want to work. Yeah, I think but, about this a lot. But, I love yeah. my job. I would work as long as I could. Yeah. And so I'm thinking like yeah, it's going to end up being a lot, but like, I want to still be working. A lot of people, when they do this, their goal is to retire early at yeah. 50 or 40 or whatever. But like you and I, we enjoy what we do so much. I don't have that goal. And so that's an interesting thing that kind of changes the, the game for me a little. Yeah, but I think, I think it, it, at least for me, it's you don't know how long something is going to last so that when it's working, you may as well double down on it. Yeah. Because I never want to look back 10 years from now and be like, well, you know, it's not working the same as it did back then. The audience, uh, something happened, and I didn't make the most of it back then. capitalize on it. Yeah. Right. That's right. Because I always looked at it, and it's funny you mentioned uh, like, a, like a highly paid athlete on YouTube, but I always went into it thinking the average YouTuber that I used to watch, they last between five and seven years. And then either they voluntarily step back, uh, the audience grows bored of them, they're not able to keep relevant and, and they just kind of go, go a different way. So I've always seen it five to seven years and I hit five years. So I'm like, well, in my mind, I'm at that kind of peak point where, you know, I'd love for it to continue, but I just don't know. Don't you think though that we're kind of in uncharted territory? Yeah. Like a lot of the guys before lasted five to seven years, some of them maybe, but even before was only like five years ago. Yes. Who knows? Yeah. That's 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 been my biggest fear is that like even if it lasts ten, you just you're, you're clueless. This is one of the things I try to I try to point out whenever people are like, oh, you makes a lot of money from YouTube, whatever. It's like yeah, but like if you're an attorney or a doctor, you can have a pretty good idea that you're gonna have a career that's gonna span for X amount of time. You're gonna earn throughout your career, and you made partner, and you'll do this or that. Yeah. Um, it's not quite as easy when you're in YouTube and like you make a lot in a very concentrated period of time, and it could end tomorrow, and that's the scary thing. How much did you uh, did you pay for your GT? Three oh six. 
Wow. So, yeah, and it just so happened to be one of the most af- affordable ones on bring a trailer for the mileage because all the other ones, and I was I was meticulous about these numbers when I went in because yeah. you're, you're bidding against other right. people, and I was so concerned about getting caught up in the moment and be yeah. like, oh, it's another thousand, yeah. another yeah, thousand. Yeah. Or, yeah, it was, it was I think, $1,000 increments. And so it's easy to be like, well, I'm not going to lose it just for $1,000. Right. And it's easy to get carried away. Yeah. So I, I looked at all the numbers of these cars, and I think it was like 310 to 312 was my upper limit from what I'd feel comfortable spending so that if for whatever reason I sold the car, I wouldn't take a big loss on it. Yeah. And uh, so, in fact, how I won it was very interesting. Uh, we have a friend, Anthony, and he's a poker player. And one of the things that he would do to throw people off is he would throw in a bid with a with an odd number. So instead of betting like here's a hundred dollars, <laughs> he'd be like two hundred and thirty seven dollars. Right. And he said sometimes when you throw in like a weird number like that, it's gonna throw them off enough <laughs> where they're the, it, it it catches them off that they're less likely to call. And he's like, it, it works. Uh, I've been doing this for years, oh. and so I was thinking when I'm bidding, I'm like, what if I that's did one that? Of the most bizarre pieces of advice yeah. I've ever heard. But that's how I won the auction. It's interesting. The one time I threw in, so I was bidding in thousand dollar increments, and that just came up in my mind. But, and I thought, well, I'm going to bid one thousand two hundred and thirty eight dollars <laughs> instead of the usual because everyone's coming up a thousand, and that was the one that won. Why so technically you- it was like three oh six, one three eight or whatever. Why did you choose the GT? Love the car. Yeah. Love the car. I thought it was a car that people would see that not only if, so. First of all, from an investment standpoint, I'm like, yeah. there's very few cars that are that good for value. So I knew I had to get a car that was going to hold its value or increase. And I felt like these should be half a million dollar cars. Yeah. So I kind of thought for an investment, it works. Mechanically, I liked the fact that it was Ford. Yep. And you could go and get parts. Yep. So I wasn't worried about like, oh man, like we have to wait for stuff to be shipped from Italy. Yep. And totally. I also felt like if I wanted to incorporate it in some way in the channel. So I wanted something in the backdrop. And I felt, well, a Lamborghini is going to be too over the top. Yeah. Unless I get a Diablo or, you know, a cool gated Murcielago or a Countach. But the maintenance is going to be so crazy on that. And if anything were to happen, I couldn't justify spending that. Yeah. Yeah. You know, one of the things that I found about the car, mine, is that um, it is the least divisive exotic car. Yeah. Everyone loves it. Yeah. People, some guys like Ferrari, some people like Porsche, some people like Lamborghini, but everyone agrees on the Ford GT. Yeah. Somehow. It's because another. it's because of the history behind the car and it, it's seen as like Manual a car enthusiast car. Yeah, that's right. If the, you're the into cars. Yeah. Analog, totally. I feel the same way. I love that car so much. I paid 225 for mine, which no is insane. Way. How I'll many miles? You, it's got, thir- now it has 38,000 miles. Okay. It's kind of at 30. So it was a, it was a mild car. Yeah. It's been driven. But, um, but still, there are no more at 225. If there were, I'd buy them. Um, I love the car so much, and I think it's really, really special. You know, in 09, during the worst of it, there were some that sold for under 100. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Pretty good situation. I remember uh, in 2010, because this is 2009. No. Yeah, 2010, 2011, I think, when I started to buy real estate, there was a Lamborghini Diablo that was for sale on eBay, and it was $65,000. You know, there's all these, you yeah. go back and you wish you could. F40's got to 400, 300, yeah. 9. I mean, a car's two and a half now. <laughs> Would have been a good play. Yeah. <laughs> but you just never know. Yeah. And, and and like we were saying before, you don't necessarily have, I mean, I didn't have the money at the time. I'm, I'm younger. I didn't have any money for cars like that back then. Um, but also, you just didn't necessarily want to take the risk because it could have gone lower. And because right. maybe you didn't want to tie up your cash. And who yeah. Knew? Who knew Every, what Yeah. Everyone was getting rid of those cars. Yeah. No and, one yeah. was buying. Right. No one. And a lot of people needed to sell. Yeah. It was a tough And I remember the Ferrari 360s were hitting the $50,000 yeah. range for a Ferrari 360. And even though those are double yeah. that now. Yes. I mean, those aren't even that great. Right. <laughs> I had one of those. It was not that great of a car. 60 is about what it's worth. Um, no offense to the Ferrari 360 crowd out there. No, I like that car, but it's not. I, it's crazy that everything has gone up in value. Even yeah. cars that aren't really all that great. Yeah. Everything in life. Property and yeah. it's a crazy. What world. are your thoughts on the car market right now? Um, just that it is it's over it's overinflated for the new cars and the recent used cars, the chip shortage stuff. But I really do believe that like some of these really special cars, I think will never come back down. And I think there's people holding out saying, "Oh, when this bubble bursts, I'll pick up a Ford GT at 200 again. They'll come back down." I don't think it's happening. I think that yeah. some of those cars are gone. You know, I've heard as far as a bubble is concerned, some companies are giving loans on cars and people are going to be underwater 
from what they owe in the car versus what the car is worth. What are your thoughts on on a bubble popping in the sense that people are underwater on the cars? Well, I wonder, like, I have been curious about how people are financing some new cars where dealers are getting twenty, thirty thousand over sticker at one hundred percent financing. Right. So, yes. are banks really loaning thirty grand over, twenty grand over? G wagons, a new G sixty three. Yeah. Is a hundred thousand dollars over right now? If you're lucky, some dudes are charging one hundred fifty over. Okay, one hundred and fifty. The ba- that's isn't that double? They they like, got really expensive. Are I think you serious? Our, I think sticker on those is like well, like one ninety now. No, but people are paying three hundred for G sixty threes, and not some people. Every single new G sixty three transacting right now is going one hundred hundred fifty over. Okay, what? every single one. You drive around, you see a new G sixty three. That dude paid three hundred thousand dollars for that car. I'm not exact. Or he got really lucky and did it before any of this happened. And even then, they were asking fifty over. So then I'm sitting here thinking, what are banks financing? A hundred over. How, what are people doing? Like, how is this happening? I'm they so would. curious about that. You know what? Are they taking out home equity? Like, what is happening? Yeah, because it, it, I, that's interesting. I actually never thought of that. Because with a house, banks will get an appraisal. And so they'll know, based on the comps of all the other properties, yeah. it's worth this, and you have to put down right. you know, 10 to 25%, and then cover the difference. Right. If you're paying more than what the home is worth, that comes out of your pocket. But with right. cars... What appraisal is there? Right. There's not. That it says that the, the the bank assumes that the that the price you agree on with the dealership is roughly the market price because cars are relatively common and that should be the case. But like in today's market, there's all these cars selling. Defender, we were talking. Defender is twenty over, twenty five over. That's insane. And what happens when the chip shortage clears those up and suddenly they're now depreciating like normal? Not only, I mean, the Delta is already pretty bad when you finance a car that depreciates quickly. You already get underwater sometimes, but yeah. now it's going to be wild. Now, not everybody is buying cars that are, I think that the saving grace here is not everybody is buying cars that are 20 over, but a lot of people are. Yeah. This market is totally crazy. What was it? The, the average price for a Toyota Camry now is like 40 something thousand dollars. Could you believe that? The for average a Toyota price for Camry? car is now like almost. 50, something in like 40. Yeah. I remember when I remember when it hit 30 when I was like 18 and it was a huge deal. <laughs> Look at us now. I still think of new cars and I think like in the 20s because right. I remember like a Honda Accord, like new, like 24, 25. Right. And like that's my threshold. So to think 40. Right. Which shows that yeah. we're like out of touch with that segment. Yeah. But like a Civic is now, 24 doesn't even buy you like a nice Civic anymore. <laughs> it's like a base Civic. Like a, the cheapest new car is yeah. like 15, and that has, that's a disaster. That's like a Chevy Sonic. You know, it does, it's a disaster. Oh my car. gosh. That could be an issue. I never thought of it. Now, the people buying G Wagons necessarily are not Maybe, too concerned. But aren't you concerned? Uh, there, there's still an aspect of this whole like flexing and over finance, like there was in 08. I don't think it's going to be, I, there a lot of people think the budget bubble will burst and it'll be like 08 and we'll be in another recession. I don't feel that way. But there is some crazy stuff going on. <laughs> the the NFTs yeah. is a, come on. <laughs> Isn't that? Yeah. yeah, come on, <laughs> come on, Jay. <laughs> what are your thoughts on NFTs? Speaking of NFTs, no, you think that's insane? I come do. On. I don't get it. Okay, what do you, you think? I, I think I'm, it's one I'm, of the craziest yeah. things I've ever seen in my life. I think that that gives us a, fi- a fantastic proof that we're in a, a bubble. If you want a proof that we're in a bubble in some situations, I don't think for all, I don't think we're going to have another recession. I don't think any of that. But if you want another a proof that we're like crazy stuff is going down, look at NFTs. Are you it's, an NFT yeah. fan? No. <laughs> No, I think the digital art, I'm completely against that. I love how you can use it as like a digital certificate of authenticity. I think yeah. that's valid. And I like, uh, the, the, I like the use case of it, but I don't like the whole digital art. Who's thing. No, buying I these NFTs? You hear no some idea. crazy stuff. People paid $400,000 for this or that. Oh, that's cheap now. Yeah. Depending on the NFT. Right. Yeah. But like who, it's not like you, usually when you hear somebody paid $2 million for a piece of art, you assume it's some very old person who just has a ton of money and wanted it. But like- that's I not, think that's yeah. not old people buying rich old people buying NFTs. I know. I think that market's going to crash really hard, like ninety nine percent, and it could go up. It could triple from right. here, and then you know I look like I look stupid until eventually it'll happen. But there's no way. There's no that. Way. There's a thing. What, what, what do they call them? Now? I'm going to sound so old. It's like the, the doodle. Like the NFT is. They're called doodles. And you can just get a doodle. Yeah. And they're selling for ridiculous amounts of money. Like you, you could buy a Porsche or you could buy a doodle. Right. Like, like, I don't. How is this a thing? <laughs> is it just people have so much money? The problem is everybody has, has gotten so much money over the last 18 months because yeah. their stock market investments have absolutely gone crazy. Their home has gone crazy. People are like flush with, there was, there was yeah. government money that came in, especially to private to business owners that they didn't maybe necessarily need, but were forgiven. Yeah. People I are think rich. it's all just, it's speculative. It's yeah. just people thinking that, they missed okay, the boat well, on crypt, yeah, crypto punks have gone up. Yep. Board apes are 
ex- really expensive now. And it's like, well, this whole NFT space is new. Yeah. And what if they come out with this metaverse or to yeah. central land or the sandbox? Get in early. Yeah. yeah. And so if I buy this, well, chances are all these other people want to get in too. And the crazy thing is that, uh, that most people don't think about is that it, it is difficult to buy an NFT now. Like, think of it. If you want to buy an NFT, where do you go? Most people have no clue. Yeah. And when it gets to the point where you could go online and buy an NFT yeah. like you can on yeah, Amazon, yeah, yeah. that's the point I think the whole market is going to blow up. It, it's going to go so crazy for a few months, and then it's just the whole thing's going to yeah, pop. Yeah, that's an interesting point. That's an interesting point. Yeah. But you're right. That's a good... There's a lot of investments right now probably that are being fueled by a sense of having missed out. Yes. The car world, it's very clear. Yeah. Like, people are paying crazy money for stuff that just, you're like... But part of me is like, this is what things cost now. I think that people, as they age, have a difficult time. You talk to older people about some of the cars when they were younger, and they're like, I remember when that was a $6,000 used car. And it's like, well, things change. And I think it's difficult sometimes for people to realize that that change has (laughs) happened. Like, this is permanent. This is what it is now. Yeah. And so maybe we're wrong and this is just what things cost now. <laughs> including it could NFTs. Be. I think it's getting to the point where you're seeing like friends or seeing other people make a lot of money and you're thinking, well, if they're doing it, yeah. maybe I should do it. Um, our friend Andre Jick, got, I think he spent $15,000 on a Spider-Man NFT. It's worth $100,000 oh. now a few weeks later. And, and it's worth in the sense that he's sold it for that? Or like, how, no. do you, how do you value this thing? What other Spider-Man NFTs have sold for <laughs> us? So it's like, same with the car. It's like, if you bought the car, well, another Ford GT sold it this. So that makes mine worth that now. Interesting. And um, they're similar enough that you can value them in that way? Yes. Huh. Yeah. So within a few weeks, 15 to 100. And I'm thinking, well, you know, if he's doing that in a few weeks, maybe, you know, Man, right, I should buy one. You know, setup. maybe I try a spider. Of dumping man. six grand in the market yeah. tomorrow morning, maybe you pick up it. Exactly, but when you start having those thoughts, usually that's the time yeah. where it's a terrible it's already, time it's to buy. Passed. Yeah. Exactly, but yeah. I wouldn't have bought it for fifteen to begin with. This is one of the reasons, though, why I think that people should largely invest in what they know, and why I've put a, more money in cars than I should, but it's worked out because I know I knew what cars were going to go up. In my opinion, I knew I was the. This is smart. This is what's going to be good, and it has worked out. It has worked out handsomely. And if you do the NFT thing because other people are doing it, maybe you're not as sophisticated. Yes. No, I would agree with that. If you didn't get the GT, what would you have gotten? Um, I really... Back then, that's all I wanted. I don't know why. The whole thing's weird. I don't know why I have that. I'm not like a supercar guy. Mm-hmm. Like, I don't get into cars like that. Um, but I love that one. Um, I don't know what I would have gotten. I wasn't looking to just spend a ton of money. I just thought it would be cool, and I didn't think I'd have it long. And it's been now th- almost four years, and I'm not selling. Um, but I, there's other cars that I kind of want or wanted before things went crazy, and um, I really wanted a Porsche Carrera GT, yeah. and I screwed that up, I think. Um, but I couldn't have afforded There was no point where I could have comfortably afforded it. When I, when I was close enough, I maybe could have bought a th- three or four hundred thousand dollar car comfortably and they were still seven hundred and i guess i should have stretched because now they're two yeah <laughs> what do you mean by you're not a supercar guy i just like i like weird car like i have this convertible g-wagon i have this audi station wagon that's like kind of got a weird backstory i don't like drive like mclaren's when i see that i think like that's so gauche like i i don't i wouldn't it's loud and it shouts to everybody i don't i like him very very like subtle and understated when it comes to like showing i really i like feel like a new englander when it comes to like showing off i like don't do that i like don't believe in like huge displays of wealth and all that stuff it's not my thing and so it's it's a very odd thing for me to have a supercar because like my it doesn't match my personality but that car is special what would it be in a car that would appeal to you um like what would i get what yeah like what in a car appeals to you i like to buy iconic i really like to buy cars that i view as iconic or is like very special and unusual um, this, the Audi station wagon is iconic because it was the first Audi RS car, which has become this like vaunted brand. And because also it was built by Porsche in Porsche's factory. And those are cool things. And that sort of like geekiness appeals to me. I don't like the cars where you're at the gas station and a dude in a minivan walks up and says, do you want to trade? Like those aren't my cars. <laughs> I like the cars where I'm driving that Audi and like one, I've owned that car 18 months and one guy has come up to me and be like, holy crap, I cannot believe this is here. And that is the kind of conversation <laughs> I'll have for an hour on the side of the road. Did that 
that person know who you were? Yeah, or they, which yeah, kind of ruins the whole oh, thing no. because like I really just want to, and it was fine. He still just wanted to talk about the car, which was cool. But like I would love, I, I, I once a year I get a conversation about cars where the person has no clue who I am, and I savor the hell. Out of those. <laughs> it's a, it's a fun one to have to like hear perspectives where you're, where they're not changed by the fact that they know who they're talking. Yeah. About. That's but, yeah. <laughs> that's interesting about the want to trade. I I've gotten that before. Oh yeah, all yeah. the time. What do you mean you want to trade? Yeah, want to trade? What kind of gas mileage do you get? How fast do you had it? Yeah, I just want to be like, and I answer and I'm very polite, but at the same time I'm thinking you're not a car enthusiast, and I didn't buy this car to like have these conversations. <laughs> yeah, like I bought it because I'm really into it, and so like the cars that I'm that I'm really into, it's fun to have conversations with other people who are into it. That's interesting. See, I've I because I rarely take out the GT, and it's been a while since I've driven the Lotus. But uh, I, I, it's been so long since someone says, how fast have you taken it? Yeah. But now I remember that was one of the most common questions. Yep. And people were disappointed when I said the speed limit. <laughs> and, and that was kind of the, the, the real answer. Because well, I don't, I, I get so worked up about speeding. Yeah. I just get nervous. And I'm like, is it worth the ticket? No. <laughs> I, I, I have just as much fun at 75 as yeah. I imagine I would have at 130. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I just, I, oh God, I, those are tough ones and, and they're so cliche. I hate any sort of cliche conversation. I can't do those. It's yeah. not my thing. And so that, those are hard and that car inspires it. And that's the thing I don't like about it. And I don't like that people are taking camera phones. Honestly, truthfully, 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 when I bought that car, I thought it would be kind of subtle. It's a Ford. It's yeah. dark colored. I didn't realize what would happen, which is people go nuts. And especially because that car has its iconic status has increased in the last few years, in part because of the movie. Yes. And in part because the values have gone up and people kind of are aware of that. And the new one came out, which I think helped it too. And, and so it's it, The reaction is wild taking that car yeah. out. People really go crazy. What do you think of the new one selling for a million dollars? Cause they, cause what are they selling for? MSRP is five hundred, five fifty. Depending on what you got, like yeah, five to six fifty, depending on the version. Got yeah. it. And, and all of them sell. There's a floor of a million dollars to buy that. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think people are buying it because it's very scarce and it's very special, and that they know that. I don't think it's to be diplomatic. I don't think it's a better car than ours. I love ours. Yeah. It's a stick. It's got way more room. The Ford dealers will work on it. People will work on it. The new Ford GT, you know who's the happiest about new Ford GTs right now? It's Ford because they're running out of warranty and Ford doesn't have to put mm. up with this crap anymore. <laughs> Those cars are incredibly complex. They were built in a very complex factory and very in a very complex way. And I don't want to be stuck with that thing in 10 years. And also it's like, a race car. Have you been in one of those? No. It's tight and it's, you're sitting this, this is the space you have yeah. between the dude next to you. It's a couple inches and it's like tight and it's loud and it's rough and it's not like ours. Ours are like a drivable supercar, which is the coolest thing about it. Like you said, it's Ford. It's a, right. the new one isn't like that. And so I don't know, people are spending the million dollars not to drive them. It's not for that. Right. It's not because it offers some amazing experience. You can't get somewhere else. Ford has said they benchmarked the McLaren 675 LT when they made the car. That's not that valuable of a car. It, it, the, the, the special thing about that car is how rare it is. Right. And that just a million bucks a lot. Do you think the floor is going to stay at a million? Yeah. I don't think the car is, the car is desirable, but I don't think it's insane. It's not a Courage GT. It's not like a true icon car. When you look at the performance numbers and everything, I don't think it's going to be, I don't think it's going to go down as like a five, $10 million car one yeah. day. Um, and I think serviceability is going to be a big part of that, honestly. Got it. What cars do you think will become a car like the Carrera GT today? Because I think we we missed the Lexus LFA when those were selling for like three fifty. Okay. LFA yeah. I think is the most overrated car. Really, this is a, this is a very controversial. Uh oh. <laughs> okay. It's an automatic Lexus. The transmission is bad, and I don't think the car looks that good. And I swear <laughs> no. to God, I swear to God that if you didn't know <laughs> that it was worth six hundred grand and you saw one, like if my wife saw one, yeah, you would have no clue. You'd be like, "This is just a car." The LC, which is Lexus's current sports car, sporty car, seventy, eighty grand, whatever, looks better. The LFA has a bad transmission. It has average looks, and I think it just went up like everything went up. And people think it looks, sounds good, and they know it's rare. And everything rare is expensive. But I think that's the most overvalued car. Oh, no. So what is yeah. going to go up? <laughs> All right. I don't know. I, it's an interesting question. I mean, it's really tough to figure that out. I think the Ford GTs still have a little bit of a ways to go. I think Lamborghini Murcielagos, especially certain yes. versions of them, are going to go the up. The SV. The SVs, yeah. But even just the regular LP640s, I think. Um, just some cars. It's just It's tough to know, of course. But... Anything that's special now will only become more and more special. Yeah. And, and the cool thing that the Ford GT has and the Carrera GT has is being an analog manual transmission car, 
you didn't know at the time, but that went that went away. And I think as hybrids and electric cars start to show up, even just having a gas engine will be sort of thought of like a manual yep. transmission. What other cars do you find overvalued <laughs> or overhyped? Oh yeah, we um, want to dig into this. The LFA. The LFA Nurburgring edition, yeah. the LFA Track. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> I like the LFA. I just it's six hundred or whatever. It's insane. You know, Lexus when that car came out, Lexus hired a full time employee to go around the country trying to get people to buy it. They he took it to dealers, he took it to events. Wow, desperate. They were desperate when that car came out. Lexus would only let you lease it because they didn't want people to buy it and flip it and make money. So you could only lease it, and then after a while, they would let you buy it. And it was laughable wow. because nobody was speculating on that car. They were 500 sticker. They were worth instantly 250. Nobody get. And anyway, now here we are, and they're way more expensive <laughs> now, and they shouldn't be. Um, other cars that I think are overvalued, I think new Ford GT, frankly, is a little overvalued. Or even just overrated. Like people make them up to be something better than what they are. That's a good question. I think. I don't know. I'd have to think about that. If you look at virtually every exotic car every special car that was passed up at, at its time i had a whole list of these the other day with my friends that i was kind of going through that i found interesting actually a good example is the prior nsx the last generation nsx lasted all the way through 2005 by the end no one wanted them they were sitting in showrooms it was a disaster and now those ones are the most desirable yeah. and they are selling for huge money. over two hundred thousand not a bad so. example as well yeah that car they had trouble selling them in 06 05 they sold them to whoever's buying them by 06 people it was a lot of money for a ford people were, nobody really wanted them they had to cut production early career gt was the same way they cut production of that car early which is insane to imagine now and here we are and i think there's a lot of these but in terms of other overvalued cars and overhyped cars the best example is air-cooled porsches there's no question 80s and 90s porsches People are now paying a hundred grand for like yeah. a regular one. It's a joke. Cars not cars just not that great. Hmm. It, it's not reliable. Uh, it's not particularly exciting. There's a million of them. There you you can't go to a car show without seeing twenty five air cooled Porsches. They've all been well preserved. They're just I don't think they're that special. And I think that some of these prices are just stupid. People. Whenever, whenever a car, a car sells, you know, a, a two-mile Honda Civic sells for big money in 80s one, people freak out. How could someone pay for 30 grand for a Honda Civic? No way. I'm freaking out. Like, how could someone pay 100 for an 80s, regular 80s 911? Like, that's crazy to me. Mm. Talk about I'd rather buy an NFT. <laughs> oh, and that, and that says a lot. <laughs> yeah. Jeez. What else? What, uh, what, what are there? Think, yeah. Is the Ford GT your only special car? No. So I have a Lotus Evora. Oh, you have? Oh, really? Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. I've, I've yet to... Wow. Actually, this is the first time I've mentioned it, maybe. I think we showed it off on the uh, It's the Family before. Barely. Stuff in after hour. Barely. I've, I've, well, we could keep this in there, but uh, I haven't told anybody about buying this car because I didn't want to make a deal of it. And I don't want to get... Because the thing is, it's chrome purple. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I bought it, so I bought it from our friend Anthony, who's the, the poker guy. And he didn't have enough room in his garage for his cars. So he was like, can I... Park this in your garage. I, I didn't mind. And it sat there for months. And he was like, do you want to buy it? And he offered it to me at a price where it was like, I would be stupid for turning it down. He's like, right. either I'm going to turn it into, uh, I'm just going to basically just give it into the dealer or whatever. They're going to give me this price. But if you give me this, uh, I'll sell it to you. It's like, I may as well do it. I've had so much fun with that car. Yeah. Do you feel as though your finances are scrutinized extra by people? Like if you were to announce that you got it. <sighs> Yeah. See, people don't understand if if they and I don't want to say how much I paid for it, but it was at a price where it's like right. it would be impossible to lose money on this car. I'm making money if I were to sell it, but I wouldn't sell it. Right. But it's just the 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 color, the aggression of the car, the orange calipers and little <laughs> thing. It's just yes, people would immediately think that's a waste of money. Right. So yes. do you have? Do you feel like you have some? anxiety about showing things like that like do you have other stuff that you don't show people because no. you don't want uh i don't talk about prices of certain things like the piano was something i could justify so so i got this piano it was eighty thousand dollars new in 1980 okay. so it was like this crazy right. piano i paid sixteen thousand dollars for it used but it's the, the pianos are like cars like right. certain ones will either appreciate in value or they stay the same this is a piano that's 16. I could sell it for 16. I could sell it maybe 17. Uh, but certain stuff like that, people would be like, you spent so much money on a piano. <laughs> but it's this, it's like a savings account. Yeah. So everything I buy is a savings account. There's, yeah. there's The only one thing that I've spent money on that loses money is the aquarium. 
That's the one thing. That's, that's my thing one thing. Giving yourself. I feel the same way. I don't yeah. buy anything unless I feel like it's either going to stay the same or make money. I've made an exception for my normal everyday car just because I knew I'd be putting a lot of miles on it and I didn't think I could get away with it. And plus, I also feel like having like a lot of safety features and stuff is really yes. important. So I want to buy a new car uh. or a pretty new car. But I agree. I generally would prefer to do that. But there's you're not holding any secrets out here where you're like, I don't really want to <sighs> Oh, you know what? There's people. one thing I didn't. Uh, well, I didn't. I, well, I guess we did it on the Stefamily. Usually when I when I mean like talking about it, it's like usually a main channel sort of thing, but I bought a, a Patek Philippe, a watch, and uh, I thought you know it was a big milestone kind of watch for me, and yeah. but it was a good value, yeah. And that's a watch that uh, I got at a price. Uh, Federico hooked it up from Federico Talks Watches. He gave me his like rock bottom price. It's like not a wholesale price, but. You know, but I didn't want to be like, hey, guys, I got this watch. Right. So, I, oh, you know what? I did hide the, the house I bought for a while. Yeah. Uh, but that was, I closed on it a month and a half before COVID hit, yeah. and I was planning to do a house tour, and I thought it would be in really bad taste yeah, yeah, yeah. to be like, hey, guys, just bought this new house. Well, yeah. everything is shut down. Do you I, not worry about privacy? No. You don't worry people going to show up and start no. breaking in and kill you? Knock on wood. No, <laughs> I nothing's mean, nothing's ever kidnapped. happened. Nothing's no. ever happened until it does. <laughs> Gosh. I mean, here's the thing is that, I, I, first of all, we have cameras everywhere. So if you if you approach, like, everything's being recorded everywhere. So it's impossible that someone can show up and we not have it on camera. But everyone that I've met, and first of all, no one's shown up, but everyone. One person. But he was a neighbor. No. Which well, I was, it was someone that was looking at, like, the model homes. And I like was getting out of the car, and I think that they kind of came probably with some ulterior motive, like you know, <sighs> seeing if they could see us in the front yard. He's like, "It jacked," as I was like walking into the house. Oh, I went and said hello. Yeah, yeah. Um, I was but it wasn't anything bad. It was like a kid and his mom. It was like totally right. But what if it is somebody? It's a good I've point. never had a bad experience. So, so the one person that did show up, they knocked on the front door, and the guy pulled up in a McLaren, <laughs> and uh, he wanted to introduce himself because he lived down the street. And, like, I'd prefer nobody knock on the door. Yeah. Um, but because he He's lived down the street, I've made I could, for neighbors as well, I could yeah. justify yeah, it, yeah. but I didn't like it. Yeah. Because it wasn't like I wanted to introduce myself as a neighbor. It was, hey, I saw yeah. you bought the house and... You know, it wasn't a neighborly story. He's not, not doing this with all the neighbors. But just, still, he's just with me. There, and so you want to be I could, friendly. And ju- I could justify makes, yeah, it. I he could didn't drive in from Glendale. To, to, no. Right. No. But everyone that I've met otherwise has been so nice. And it's, know, it's you weird. You don't know who's watching. There's p- crazy But people. it's finance. It's like, it, And it's weird. Be, but be that's t- part, that increases it because you're saying, oh, I have this much money. I have this much and this and that. The people that, first of all, the people that watch the channel know that the things, I have very few things of value. Almost, I'm so frugal in so many aspects. They're not getting that piano. They're, they're not. <laughs> uh, good luck if you're trying to steal a seven foot grand piano. I mean, of all things to do, and you and we have cameras on the inside too. So like yeah. everything would be would be recorded. But uh, I mean, people know how frugal I am. The aquarium's worth more than than anything else I have. No one is stealing an aquarium or going and like taking a piece of coral. <laughs> Um, but everyone in finance has been so nice. I think it's a, it's a more mature audience. They understand the aspects of like saving money. And it's different because I was talking with uh, James about this, Stradman. And he was saying how often he'd yeah. have people show up to okay, his well, front door. He films in front, every video in front of his house. I mean, you're, at some point... You're just kind of asking for like something to happen. Like it's one thing to be like insane, and it's when you're doing that and you're not living in a gated community. It's just kind of like mm-hmm. the way it's going to go. Right? right. Well, the Ve- Vegas is gated, um, and so is the place in LA. So I mean, both of them are gated, but um, I'm not so much worried about it. But you're you're right. I probably should be more. I probably should be more careful. Right. You never. But know. I've I've had There's nothing but good experiences. Yeah. Same. I've had yeah. you know countless thousands of people come to me and. Every single interaction has been nice, but you just never quite know, you know? Yes. You know? Yeah. Have you ever had anybody not be great when they meet you randomly? No. Have we? No. I don't think so. Everyone's been really good. Yeah. The only thing that would be an issue, but it's not even that big of an issue, yeah. is sometimes they uh, take a lot of time. Yeah. So it's not, like, oh, it's not just like, yeah. hey, you know, I really appreciate what you're doing. Like, yeah. they'll be there for like, you know, 10, 15 minutes. They keep going, 20. Like, they just the, kind of The push polite it. people are the ones who met you decide. Because sometimes I got 10 minutes. And I'm like, or yeah, if they yeah, say something course. interesting about right. like, yeah. I have a cool car. Some, huh, okay, I want to hear more about that. 
but sometimes it's Maybe like... Maybe it's just in passing, and then it kind of takes, you know, you're yeah. on your way somewhere or something like right. that. Yeah. yeah. You can never uh, really be in a hurry when you're just kind of walking around in public. <laughs> right, right. But everyone has really good intentions. Yeah. And sometimes yeah, it's like, you know, even if they do take a lot of time, and I'm like, I kind of... I try to make myself like I'm gonna walk this way now, and they'll kind of walk with you. And the thing that I always think yeah. about is like this is a highlight for them of their day. Of their yeah, week. yeah. And and uh, the other day I was like, I, sometimes when you're not in a good mood, it's really tough. If someone comes up to you and you like just want to go to the grocery store and buy something and like go home and just like sit, and you're like sad or whatever. That's when it's hardest because you got to like kind of put on a show for them because this is a special thing for them, and that's like. Now nah, those are the worst ones. Yeah, <laughs> and that happens sometimes. But you know, yeah. how often do you get seen in like the GT? <laughs> like, what what's the reaction you get in this? Um, I would flip if I saw you on the freeway. <laughs> first of all, I'd see a GT and I'd be like, "Oh my, that that Dr. Mira, yeah, I'd the cars, lose it." I I maybe made a mistake being too open about the cars because. Yeah. People now know it's not just like, oh, wow, I'm seeing a convertible G-Wagon. It's like, oh, that's Doug. And I know and some people follow you. And I don't love that because I don't know how that's going to turn out when yeah. I stop. And I don't really want people to follow me home or whatever. And, um, but, yeah, the car, people recognize me in the cars pretty often. With the GT, that itself uh, expire, in, inspires so much of a reaction that it's hard to know, is it me or is it the car? Yeah. But the other cars, yeah, people, people know and they get excited. And I don't know. You... You just hope they don't crash when they're driving, trying to take a picture. Yeah, right now. yeah. <laughs> Which is sometimes a little sketchy. You're yeah. Like, oh, hey, it does right. seem like the car audience is so much bigger, though. Yeah. Because with finance, it's like if you're, if you're into saving money, you kind of know of the channel or you've seen a few videos. And plus, it's a more mature audience, like you said. Right. I agree that. My audience yeah. tends to be a little more mature than most car people because I'm doing reviews. Stradman is out there, like, vlogging his life, and I think that that incites... He gets a, he has a huge audience, but I think that, to some extent, there's just people kind of watching for entertainment, whatever. A lot more of my viewers are, like, just people yes. looking for a car. I would say the difference with James is that people watch him for his personality. Yeah. And that's the big selling point. Yeah. I personally, I, and I, wa I watch his videos. I don't care what car he buys. I yeah, think that's just, cool. That's the it's backdrop. It's cool to hear him talk it's, about it. It's yeah. just a backdrop prop for him. Yeah. But I think people watch him for him. I think it, even if it weren't cars, if it were bicycles, yeah. he would have the same yeah. sort of attraction. Yeah. Uh, and people feel like they know him from yeah. those videos because he shows so much of himself. Yeah, I think that that's true. And I think doing car reviews, it's a little bit less like that. People are just here. They need to get a car. And so I, it's, I'm not that concerned. People are generally relatively mature and that kind of thing. But you just you open yourself up to like the wholesale public. <laughs> and yeah. there's something that's like. <laughs> yeah. But I'm always just worried. I guess my, my biggest concern is sometimes we'll, we'll have a very private conversation and uh, the, the person next to us will be listening. In. Yeah. And I remember having it once where, where I, I never thought of it as an issue, but I was having a talk with somebody else uh, who worked for somebody else. And it was a very private conversation. And, and after he got up or he, he was leaving and the lady next to us listened to the entire thing. And she's and not to me, to the other guy. By the way, I, I want to say I, I love your work. I, I, I didn't want to bother you guys because I, I knew you were in a conversation, huh. but like I really enjoy it. I just <laughs> want to say hi. But I was like, wow, like what did this person? I mean, it was nothing bad. Just private. That, you do that's have to all. be more careful. It yeah. is interesting. You, you can't yell at the Comcast people on the. You know, you never know oh. who knows you and who might. You know, and so like, I, you can yeah. you have you have to be like super at any given moment. You have to assume that whatever you say might go viral. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I want to. Yeah, I do want to mention this, but I don't want to give enough details because I know this person's watching. Oh, wow. But I had a, uh, uh, I got something, and the other person, I, I was not happy with the other person, and I thought about like leaving a bad review or something because I, I, I thought this. I, I don't want to say what it was, but I wasn't happy with it. At the end, uh, I got the. I'm a huge fan of your channel. Yeah. I watch all the videos. It uh, mean a lot to me if I could just get a picture. Yeah. Like anything. And, it, and that was the most like, oh, yeah, no, absolutely. But I'm so glad that I was just <laughs> right. like, you know, just right. bit my tongue and. Yep. Yeah. Yep. It's exactly right. I did. My wife and I went on our honeymoon. We went to New Zealand and we did a uh, glacier, a helicopter to a glacier to do an ice hike. 
And the dude gives us the whole tour of the glacier. It was really cool. One of the coolest things I've ever done, land on the glacier in the helicopter, and we watch, we do all the stuff, and we have the little ice shoes and everything. And it was like two hours. And at the very end of it, the dude was like, by the way, I'm like, a, I'm, I didn't want to say anything, but I'm a huge <laughs> yeah. fan. And I was like, <laughs> I'm so glad that I was like, nice. And you know, like, yeah. <laughs> you it never makes it, know. Yeah, it makes it worse to find out after <laughs> yeah, the fact. Right. I'd like, rather just oh, know crap, up front. What if I talk? What have I said? <laughs> <laughs> I would much rather know up front. And yeah. that's like, you know, Uber drivers. He really or nice like, yeah. Because he knew that yeah. if he had said something, maybe the conversation turns to cars and my wife is there and she just wants to see the mount, you know, a like glacier and like, I get it. And so that was a cool way to do it. But at the same time, it puts a lot of pressure on you. Like, <laughs> oh, crap. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> what did I do? Gosh. I am curious about income sources. Yeah. Um, how would you say they're broken down on your channel? Because I noticed... I don't see any sponsorships. Yeah. My channel is an interesting thing because I feel like as a car reviewer, I feel like I'm more of a journalist than a entertainer. And so I don't feel too comfortable doing sponsorships um, because I start to feel like if you're getting paid, then your objectivity gets questioned and the quality, the truth to what you say, your veracity is just all kind of getting questioned. I've always wondered if that was the right move because all everybody else does sponsorships, but I, I kind of feel like the numbers have proved me right. Like the fact that my channel has always stayed so big and that people are always watching and have always believed that I'm truthful and I'm like the guy they can trust. I think that, no, that over time, the numbers have proved me right that like I was right not to do sponsors, I think. Um, I do a few here and there, but it's really rare. And for that reason. Yeah. I'll tell you from our experience. Well, uh, Jack, I'll actually let you answer this one. Were you about to say something? I was just going to ask if uh, oh. car makes have ever paid you or offered to pay you to um, do a review. Yeah. This is one of my like biggest annoyance topics about the car journalist industry. I don't know if you guys know how car reviews are done, mm -hmm. but the way a car review is done, the automaker sends you an email and says, hey, guess what? We're, gonna, we're launching a new car. Subaru Legacy, I'll give you as an example. Um, and... The way it's going to work is you can fly out with your spouse to Big Sur to this beautiful hotel property. You get your own uh, little hut villa thing on this beautiful hotel. You can use the spa. The, while we're doing the product briefing, your wife, spouse can use the spa, can get a massage, can enjoy the property. Then you go drive the car on this beautiful drive down Highway 1. You, par you park at the end of the day. We feed you a fantastic dinner. And then uh, we look forward to your objective review. And by the way, the automaker <laughs> paid for all of this. And um, not only do I not accept literal cash from the automakers, but I am the only car reviewer currently in existence who doesn't take those trips. So they reach out and they say, hey, we're doing this Big Sur thing. And I say to them, great, I'm going to book a room at the Comfort Inn in Paso Robles. And you tell me when I have to be at the, at the event to drive the car and I'll be at the event. I don't get dinner paid. I don't get flights paid. I don't get hotels paid. And I really think that that's the correct way to do it. And none of my rivals do that. Now, they will sit there and say, we don't take money from automakers. But you kind of do. Because that trip to Big Sur is kind of an experience that's it's not free. <laughs> like, they didn't pay you for your, they didn't get you that room to have an objective review of the car. They got you that room because they wanted to butter you up so you would say these things. And so directly, no, an automaker has never offered a payment. I've never taken payment. But indirectly, I think they're all paid. And you should look very skeptically when you see <laughs> car reviews, especially when car reviews all go up on the same day. And you notice that all the pictures are in the same place. That's because they all went to some five-star hotel in some special place and got some crazy perks to give an objective review of the car. And it ain't an objective at all. Ever. Gosh. That reminds us of uh, the channel. We've received so many requests from people who want to pay to be featured. Yeah. And some of them, I got to say, are so tempting. Yeah. Because it's a lot of money. Yeah. But we've never done it. Because don't yeah. you think your audience, like, I feel like that's, that's you, the, the a lot of money comes in that day. But long term, your audience is like, he's getting paid. Yeah. Well, I just like saying we've never paid, yeah. uh, we've never been paid to have a guest on. And, and you can't say that. If one of them, even yeah. if you do 500 episodes, yep. if one was paid, then you can't say we've never done that. Yeah. And so, you can yeah. maintain th this air of like being kind of high and mighty. And I'm kind of holier than thou about this, but I can be because I've never 
take it. I've never done this. And that gives me, I think, an objectivity that a lot of my rivals don't have. And I think it's an objectivity that a lot of the viewers appreciate. And I suspect the same is true for yeah. you. But I do think for sponsorships, I don't think anybody would mind. Yeah, I probably need to do more. And I've yes. been thinking about that this year. And I would just be careful about the sponsors you pick. Yeah, but I not think, cars, not car brands. Right. But yeah. I think if you did a good sponsorship with a great brand um, to integrate. That's, that's right. I would like to do more with, st especially products that I like believe in and that I know are good. Yeah. So I think you could do that really well. Even uh, what it was, the Raycon headphones or, mm -hmm. or something like that. I think would Audible. be... Yeah, or Audible. Yeah. Something that you could do, you know, if you if you want to listen to an audiobook and you want, want to have a headphone in when you're driving. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's probably true. I probably should do more, and I think I should do more in that space. And honestly, even just within the last few weeks, I've reached out to a couple people that I hadn't in the yeah. past asking about that. I would pursue it. I think for the amount of value that you provide in a video, a 20, 25-minute long video, I think halfway through having a sponsor, no one would bat an eye. Yeah, or, especially because everyone else, yeah. literally everyone else yes. does it. It's the, gotten so common. The other thing is you could negotiate because you have so much leverage to put it at the very end of a video <laughs> where, you know, you'll get paid half, but it's there and it's there. Yeah, yeah. It's at the very end. I and didn't know no that was one, even on the table. Yeah. So uh, Drew, you can negotiate anything yeah. in a sponsor. Yeah. I didn't think, a, I, of course, but I didn't think a sponsor would even want, like, go for that. Yes. <laughs> Drew Gooden always does it. Yeah. He's, he's another channel because if he did integrations in the middle it'll kind of throw off the flow of the video and that's yeah. my biggest thing i don't mind doing sponsors now my biggest worry is will it throw off the flow of the video if it will i won't do a sponsor because i'm i care more about the video itself but if it won't if there's no harm in it then then i I'd, I'd like to do yeah them. yeah that makes sense that makes sense and automotive is rife with this i mean this is a big deal in automotive because uh, like I, it's not quite the same as finance but our viewers are also pretty wealthy pretty in the world of buying stuff obviously if you're watching car reviews mm -hmm. you probably have some money etc it's not like you know some stupid vlog about whatever um and so the sponsors pay pretty well and that kind of thing. yeah i would do that i think you would be shocked yeah. how different the income would look yeah. when you look when you take into account sponsors. Yeah, yeah that's probably yeah. true. Like I thought here the ad revenue was uh, was the main, you know, creme de la creme, but as you as you begin expanding, you realize it's only a, a portion of it. Yeah. 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 But how is your income broken down in the sense of like ad revenue, cars and bids? Could you talk like a percentage? Um I'm not pulling much money out of cars and bids yet. Um so as a result, YouTube ad revenue is like the absolute primary driver. Almost all of my income comes from that. And it has for a long time. Um, now, part of the reason that I'm not pulling money out of cars and bids yet is because it's still growing and we're trying to reinvest in that sort of thing. And I could if I wanted to. But, um, and I see that as hopefully a long-term, a more long-term, like the income play, yeah. like we've discussed. Um, but yeah, I mean, ad revenue has, has just been... It's been fantastic. It's been consistent. And that's been, a, that's like my huge driver. Yeah. Have you thought about offering anything other than cars and bids? Like maybe something you're more involved in, whether it be like, a, I don't know. For, for us, we have like programs, do a course. Yeah. Is there something like that? Yeah, that I've you thought get about it. In? And I think yeah. that's probably a future thing. Honestly, the thing about cars and bids is like right now it's my thing and I'm doing it. But I think it's almost, you're almost at that point, like with your kid learning how to ride a bike where you kind of can push it and let it kind of do its thing without quite as much of my involvement. And so then the question is, what do you do next? Now, what I've been telling everybody is, I don't want to do any more of this crap. <laughs> it's a lot of work. Yeah. Starting the channel and getting to where I got has been a lot of work. And then launching this business was a lot of work. And so I think I do want to do something like, yeah, like that, or like a podcast where it's, it's not like building a business quite necessarily. I don't want to, I'm good. Like, I'm just good. Yeah. You know what it's I would tiring. do? Doug DeMuro 2, the second channel, more Doug DeMuro. I'd start posting on there weekly with sponsors. Yeah. That's what I would do. Yeah. That way the main channel stays intact. You you keep all of that uh, to yourself. Yeah. But I think the uh, more Doug DeMuro. Yeah, that might make sense. That Once might make a sense. week. I took all the more Doug videos, not off, but since about March, I've been posting the more Doug videos on my main channel on Sundays. And maybe it would make sense to go back and do sponsors on the other. I like the sit-down talks in your garage. Same. I love Those them too. Those are my favorite. And they're easy. Yes. But I think you have to be a certain type of like interested person to like appreciate them. They certainly you don't have get an, as many you, you have enough interested people. I do. To, yeah. Yeah. Surprisingly. Yeah. Like, I can't believe how like many Like your people. interested audience is my entire main channel on an <laughs> average video is your interested audience. <laughs> It's nuts because I'm looking at the video, the views on your second channel. They're really, really, really high. Yeah, they're good. Yeah. 
So that's what and I would do. become yeah. even better. So I moved those. I started doing those videos last March on my main channel on Sundays, and they're even better now. Yeah. And it's like, Because wow. I'm surprised at some of the videos that you post on. I, w- I would think this is main channel worthy. Yeah. But it's well, like, no. Nah, just... Yeah. In retrospect, I wish that I had done some things a little different. Yeah, like the, the Rolls Royce channel. one. I was but like, how is that on the there? The second channel was, I was always feeling like if I de- deviated at all on the main channel, that it would screw up my algorithm on the main channel. And over time, I have discovered that the algorithm is a little bit more sophisticated than that. And you can post a stupid video on a Sunday that only gets a couple hundred thousand views and then go back to getting a million views on Tuesdays and Thursdays where I normally post. And it actually is capable of handling that. I don't think it always was. I have a theory that it wasn't at some point. I have a theory based on some other people's uh, performance that they started posting some kind of second rate stuff and it took sort of slid the whole channel. But I think now it's capable of realizing, okay, Sundays he posts, it's less good. That so doesn't mean it's going to hurt. My you experience uh, is always the YouTube algorithm is forgiving of two bad videos in a row. That's, that's it. So if I have one bad video, it's like, okay, the pressure's on. I have <laughs> one more mess. If I mess up that second video, if the third is not a banger, it takes months to recover from that. Interesting. That, that's been my so that's, experience. That, you know, I will tell you, though, one, one benefit I have with car reviews is at least once or twice a month, I can get an insane video because new cars come out to a level. So, like, Lucid Air, Rivian, I knew those videos would blow up. They did blow up. And you can be pretty strategic about where you can put them. If you have a couple bad videos three or four even, you can put a Rivian up next and everything yeah. is all smoothed over at that yeah. point. And you probably don't have quite the same ability no. to like snap your fingers and say, but this is going to blow up. And I just it is it. interesting, but one good video I've noticed, it, YouTube puts you in a tier and you'll you'll get views within a certain range. Yeah. And you need one video that blows those metrics that will boost you into the next tier. Yeah. And then that next video afterwards is going to be pushed in that tier. But if you're not able to sustain that on your own, then you get boosted or you get dropped yeah. back down. You're, you know, back to the average. Like, I don't know any of the other car YouTubers really except a text. They all kind of view me as like the grandfather of car YouTube. And so they all kind of reach out for advice periodically. Yeah. But like, I don't generally ha- have like other people who are in the YouTube space, partially because I find a lot of other YouTubers to be kind of difficult to deal with. That's interesting because that's all who we talk like really? every That's single it. one of my friends everyone who i see on a, like on a daily basis is another youtuber and almost all of them are in the finance space i live next door to uh jeremy yeah who's uh, another financial well, YouTuber. Finance really youtubers i could imagine yeah. being more because you're you're starting from kind of a yes. higher baseline but like but, some of my car youtube colleagues i don't know how much of this you watch there's some interesting characters out there yeah <laughs> so unusual but, guys but see for us this is the same thing as being like you know introduce hey what's your net worth yeah what do you make yeah, last yeah. month <laughs> oh yeah how many high people oh yeah you should fire some people though you should get that cost down <laughs> margins are too thin now uh, because that's what we talk about so it's interesting to to see other people's like this because to me it's normal yeah. and all of us uh, like a few weeks ago we're like hey is your ad revenue down thirty percent this month yeah mine too let me text a few more people and find out yeah theirs is down as well something's going on interesting so all of us are in it interesting yeah huh. and we all compare analytics so you know so, I wonder how long have you been doing it five years. I've got so much past analytics that, like, when the ad rates go down a little for the seasonally or whatever, I'm not all that surprised. I, I'm, I'm not, I don't really get that surprised yes, anymore for but, that sort of thing. But this January is substantially worse than every other January drop. Interesting. Yeah. Huh. Have you noticed that? No, actually, surprisingly, this was my best January ever. <laughs> is that because, no, but is that because ad revenue is up or is that because? The ad rate was not as high as I thought the ad, it would be, sorry, but for ad some rates. reason the views were way up and so. Yes, so I'm talking about ad rates. So when you look at the CPM, I'm not sure what the, what, the ad rate that is this here. year for my January was about the same as last year, which is unusual because in all prior years, almost every month over month, it's always been improving. And so I, I, I actually have started in my mind wondering, like, have we hit a, are we at a that's point? interesting yeah because everyone that i've talked to says it's down 20 to 30 percent over last january uh no this is the biggest drop we've ever seen from december to january, to january okay yeah and that includes other other uh channels I, but you're the my first one is yeah. a little bit i had a big drop from december i always do i don't really look at december versus january though because yeah. i don't really find it relevant since they're so different and i also i kind of goose december i have this thing called doug sember where i put up insane content i like start shooting it in june and i like put up insane content specifically in december because i know the rate's going to be so high so <laughs> i tend to make 20 i i tend to make december's double for me i make double the money on, on an average other month 
yeah. in December. And so December is like a really big deal for me. <laughs> so like Lucid Air, Rivian, uh, the Mercedes EQS has been a big deal. A lot of like really yeah, big I like the Rivian one. Yeah. yeah. I love that, that video, video. Yeah. blew up. Yes. The, and that was, I put that on Black Friday. I have yep. no shame. <laughs> I have no shame in admitting what I did there. That's a big day. And it did well. <laughs> How many mid rolls do you put in a video? A bunch, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> three, I think four, something like that. Oh, you could do more than that. I probably could. Yeah. I probably could, but I, there's one at the start and at the end too. Yes. So you know. It's, yeah. It's the a, only time I I see I don't mind mid rolls on the phone. I do mind them on the TV. That's the only time <laughs> yeah. when I'm watching a video on the TV because it's hard to like yeah you yeah, gotta yeah. find the remote and yeah. click it off. No, and, and people get upset and annoyed. Yeah. Although my view is like get premium. It is insane to me that people will spend as much time complaining as they do when for whatever premium costs like eleven dollars a month or something. Fifteen. 12. Like come on. Yeah. I I got premium. For, I hadn't had premium for years. It never even occurred to me for some reason. And one of my friends was like, "You don't have premium." And I got it like six months ago and I haven't seen an ad yeah. since. And people are like, I have this ad blocker and that ad blocker and I do this and that. It's like, just pay the money. It's yeah. so I do easy. that to uh, download videos and then you could also close your phone and listen to the video. And that's so important. Yeah, that's the best. So yeah. that's why I pay for, pre yeah. for premium. Yeah, yeah. So. But that is interesting. I yeah. uh, No, January so far is, January was fine. Okay. But it's always, a, but it's always a significantly enhanced drop for me because I like really goose November, yeah. December. And because I actually intentionally thus put up videos I know aren't going to do as well in January. Why burn good videos when the ad rate is so bad? I agree. But yeah. the, those, some of my January videos are some of my favorites because it's like the weird stuff that I can't do when the ad rates are good because it won't get enough views. So actually my January February content tends to be like some of the more fun videos. But see, but see the sponsorships are good because it's it's more stable. Yeah. Sometimes you'll sign a, a year-long contract. Yeah. And so your December is going to be the same as January is the same as June. Yeah, yeah that makes and sense. And it's just, it's that stability that I really appreciate. Yeah, that makes sense. Now, what do you think you could work on that could make your videos better and shorts, how do you plan apparently. on expanding that shorts shorts <laughs> you think so? no i don't know I, I probably i will do some sponsors but other than that like i don't know it's tough when you're like look at all the other car review channels mm -hmm. like i'm still number one i'm ahead of them all i don't know like how else to grow this dramatically other than kind of what i've been doing yeah. so i'm going to tell you the two honestly and we just talked about them i think sponsors i think if you sprinkle them in every now and then yeah i think all you need is three good brands yeah. that you could work with consistently and you have three every month with the same brands and your audience is going to appreciate the consistency because yeah. Yeah. they know you're not going to be promoting something, you know, some crappy product or right. whatever, right. a good product and you could charge a premium because you don't do it. Yeah. You could use that. I think also shorts. I've experimented with shorts now. The short audience is totally different really? from the long form audience. And I, I was not expecting that, but every time I posted shorts, you see like the new viewers and returning viewers, the new viewer spikes way higher than the return. Huh, interesting. Yeah, so it's getting pushed to a new audience. And I think for 60 seconds, you could come up with the yeah. best oh, yeah. quirks and features. No, for and, sure. And I think it would complement what you're you already doing. You see the shorts as have, the thing, the reason I haven't done it is because I'm worried that doing something like that has a negative effect on the, the other video. Yes, I'm still testing it out. From okay. what I've seen, the shorts have no impact on hmm. main channel, like on the normal Which kind videos. of has to be true in yes. order to, for people to justify wanting right. to do that. I mean, if Correct. anything, YouTube would be wanting people right. to post shorts. Yeah. Right, I thought so. the same thing. I'm like, if I post a short, is this going to affect my click through rate? Yeah. Are they, are, are, you know, if someone skims past that, does that screw everything up or is the watch time going to mess it? No. Um, Interesting. So from what I'm I've really seen, conservative about new features. Yes. Yeah. I would try it, be cautious about it. I'm still testing it out myself, but I've had nothing but a positive experience. The one thing I have noticed, which is interesting, is that I had one short that was doing really, really, really well. And I thought, well, it's been a week since I posted a, a short. I'm going to post a new short now. The new short posted, the previous one completely cut off that very minute. Interesting. So I saw the views basically drop, Interesting. and the other short blip, okay. went up. But the new short wasn't doing as well as the previous one. So you wish you would just not. So YouTube is more likely to push a new short than an old one. Even if the old one is more... Even if the old one's better. And if the new one's better, YouTube, I think, analyzes that one as not being the newest. So it's not going to promote the new one. Because it's not good, even though the old one is better. Yeah. So I don't. I I think there's still something they're working around there. Interesting. Huh. We've also seen it in the past where YouTube has an interest in pushing out yeah. like their their newer features, such yes. as the community yeah. posts when right. they do that. Like, remember how that would blow up your channel? Right. Oh yeah, the polls. So, yeah, exactly. <laughs> but it's the same as what I've noticed with a with a long form video. When I post a new video, 
that takes priority for the for the yeah. recommended. Yeah. So I think same thing with shorts, but the two are separate at least. Interesting. I would do huh. it. That's good to know. Yeah. Huh. So how is your time allocated? And walk us through very briefly an average day in the life of Doug DeMiro. Um, it depends on whether I'm like filming that day or not. If I'm filming, that's like a lot of the day. I would say the majority of the day. Um, like wake up, go. Sometimes I'm driving two, three hours up to LA, film a video, mm-hmm. drive two, three hours home. It's kind of a disaster. Um, when I'm not doing that, a lot of the time is spent on cars and bids. I do a lot of the um, reserve setting on cars and bids, which is interesting. Because you can imagine people have different opinions about the value of their car as we do. And sometimes it gets kind of funny. Um, and I just do a lot of supporting of my team there. I edit every single listing in the end. I like have an editor who does it, but I like give it one final look over and then I write my little take on each mm-hmm. one. So that takes some time. Um, so a day can kind of depend. It can kind of depend on exactly what's being done that day. Mm-hmm. Sometimes my entire day is filming and I don't, I can't look at a thing on cars and bids and I trust my staff does it. And sometimes it's like a purely cars and bids day where I don't have any real videoing to do. And where, do you, when do you generally start working and when do you cut it off? Um, I like wake up at five thirty or six now and I can't seem to stop that. I've came from the East coast and I w- used to wake up at nine and I moved with the time difference annoyingly. <laughs> Um, and so I start working almost right away. I'm really fresh in the morning. I can do stuff really, really well in the morning. I hate afternoons more than anything in the world. I like, like to nap. I hate like the time between like one and four. Any questions for us? Um, no, I don't think so. What do you, what do you think of Strad, man? I liked him a lot. Yeah. He's awesome. He was the nicest guy. He was it's, a genuine person. Yeah, really. it's crazy. He is exactly the same. And I could say the same thing about you. Exactly the same on camera as off. And it's it's incredible with him how easy it is for him to film. Like, he'll just whip out the camera, one take, oh. with, like, perfect energy, and then it'll just be right back. Huh. It's like, how did you do that? I would have taken 20 takes You ever meet some people where you're like, wow. They're Whew. different? No, like, they suck. <laughs> oh. Like, you obviously are meeting a lot of people in the space. Obviously, you don't have to name names. But you ever yeah. meet anybody you're like... I don't want to be a part of this person. There were two. Uh, one was uh, someone who I like really looked up to, and uh, it's it's not Kevin O'Leary, by the way. <laughs> Kevin O'Leary, by the way, awesome. I was shocked. I Great I came guy. in, I came in like so nerd. I thought he was just going to be like just pure get in, get out, and he hung out with us oh, afterwards. Yeah. Like then, and he showed up alone, which I was like, I, I thought Very he was casual. Like, Huh. Yeah, I just we walked were in. friends. Yeah. Already. Oh, that's cool. Kevin O'Leary is amazing. Uh, the one which I kind of get now was a uh, was just a, a busy person, and um, basically just told me, "All right, we have forty five minutes," and just showed up. Uh, I was kind of setting up, had no interest in any conversation. Or yeah. Filmed, perfect, and then immediately after, just was like, "All right, I'll see you." That was it. Huh. And so it was just a bit disappointing yeah. because it's like you like to kind of hang yeah. out. I don't expect it, but it would just be kind of nice. Because um, otherwise I just feel like, well, then it's just for the YouTube and, yeah. you know. Um, and then the other one was just uh, I, I traveled to see this person. And then, you know, I, I made some commitments of what was expected from me and uh, immediately after showing up, I was like, I want to get out. I just, it was, it was not for me. It was not what I expected. And so, uh, so I, I cut ties. Yeah. 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 Interesting. But that- everyone else was, was good. I'll, t- I'll tell you after filming, but, <laughs> but, but yeah, but no, everyone else was fantastic. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And everyone has become a friend. Everyone that we've had on the podcast, we keep in touch with. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. Interesting. So, it would be fun, by the way, to get like a once a year. This is never going to happen. A once a year, we rent out like a warehouse like this, invite and everyone every on the podcast, podcast yeah. and that one place, one time. I would, I would love, love to do. To. I, would, right. I would love that to do like a convention. That's, yeah. like a, that's like a thing that would be a the thing. Ice coffee yeah. hour convention. I would yes. do it. Let's do it. <laughs> I would love to do it. I'll pay to re- help rent out a, right. a thing. I would do it. Okay. People just have to get their own accommodations, but we'll provide <laughs> we'll provide yeah. punch and pie. Sure. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Pizza and pie. Mm-hmm. Have a great time. Cool. Yeah, people are generally yeah. very nice in yeah. this space. At least the people that I've met, I've yeah, had great yeah. experiences with them all. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's good. It's good to know. Because mm-hmm. you never you always wonder, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. How was it with us, by the way? Because I was really nervous. I, I had planned out the trip perfectly, but the charging took a little bit too long and there was traffic. <laughs> I was five fine. minutes late. No, I felt so was, bad. Oh, no, no, I was late yeah. and, and, and I was great. I, um, I'm blown away by your setup in the sense that my setup is a disaster in comparison. I'm always shocked 
at how much gear people have. That's like the biggest thing that always surprises me. Um, Cause I just don't. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I'm always surprised like, Oh, this is what a real, <laughs> a real team does. This is how it's yeah. supposed to look. That I don't think so. Me. See, I, I, I really envy the way you, you run everything. I like the of fact course. that I it's mean, so simple. It's, it's a special I, thing I, to be able to do it yeah. that easily, but it would be also nice to, you know, know it. I don't even know what any of this stuff does. Yes. Yeah. You should see our actual setup, like our actual studio. It's, it's a room where you just sit down and press the button and we have a switchboard yeah. and we have lights everywhere. It's, yeah. it's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it always blows me. I was saying before we were on camera, this, I did this film, this commercial with Audi. And like, I just can't believe how much goes into this kind of stuff. Yeah. Like, obviously with movies, I know you see the mm -hmm. trucks around and you know, it's insane. They shut off streets and all that. But like we did a commercial. It took, it was a minute of screen time. I mean, there were truly a hundred people there. There were trailers as if there were actors on set. Like there were, it was wild. I just can't believe it. Some of the stuff that, and everybody, everything, like I press the button. I like listen to the sound all at myself. They have a guy for every single one of these jobs. And it just like blows me away. Yeah. So. Like I've seen them filming with Netflix for selling sunset and the amount of people yeah. uh, just to be in a room yeah. for filming one thing. You're right. There's a person like monitoring the audio and a person monitoring that person and a <laughs> yeah. person checking the lighting and a person watching behind the scene and like five people giving their, it's nuts. It's nuts. Yeah. It's just crazy. I cannot believe some of the setups. This is nothing in comparison. But I to know. me, this is I still know. something. I know. <laughs> but no, I like your approach and uh, that's what I've done for my channel as well. Yeah. It's one camera. Lights on the, we don't even have lights on these, uh, the or content, we don't even have towels and lights. People care about yeah. the content. Yeah. And that's what I always tell people. I still get people coming to me and being like, I'm going to make the best car channel ever with 4k drones and I'm going to do all this stuff. And I, like, I'm always encouraging of people who say this to me, but like, you're not going to see a return forever. And it sounds like you're going to spend a lot of money to not see a return. And also I just don't think that's what people are looking for necessarily. I think that people want content. None of that stuff matters. If that stuff, if you have content and that stuff, it's great. But like, that will not get you anywhere. You need to have something that people want to see. That's where it all starts to me. And if you want to pad it after that with some of that stuff, then that's something, I guess. Well, mm. I'd say that's good. That's good to end it there unless you had... I think that's uh, good. Little, well, little, thank you, Doug. Little, little nice to meet you. Yeah. By the way. Yeah? yeah, nice to meet you. Guys. Thank you so much for doing this. <laughs> yeah. I've been looking forward to this Aww. since we first uh, got in touch when I bought the GT. Yeah. And uh, I can't believe today's the day. I know. We I can't we did it. God, I'm so glad. We did it. <laughs> Thank you so much, <laughs> Thank man. Thank you. I'm glad. I'm happy to be here. <laughs> I'm excited for this to post. Guys, uh, we'll link to your channel down below in the Thank description. I, I'm sure everyone, you, you don't need an introduction. But uh, anyway, all your info is down below in the description. You guys got to subscribe. You have to do it. And uh, hit the like button. Get a free stock down below. And uh, until next time. <laughs> Thank you, cool. guys. Thank you.